call this meeting to order. Mr. Administrator, what do you got? So good morning. Um, morning. Obviously morning. we have uh, several items on the agenda uh, for today. And as you know, at the conclusion of the meeting, we're gonna be working through a remote um, setup to where we can um, have future meetings remotely. However, there was one issue um, as you're also aware, for a public hearing that had to be advertised two weeks ago. So even prior to us discussion and having that in place, uh, that public hearing, um, because of the notice provisions, is two weeks in advance. And so there's some issues we have to work through with that. But the technology is there. We're going to be uh, doing a mock walkthrough afterwards, and so we'll have that capability in the future. So Today, are we going to be okay for next week for public hearings then? For, no? for the Tuesday hearing, we, we, we did not notice it again two weeks ago. Even if we had you know, said that next last Thursday when we last met and we were talking about having remote meetings, that notice was already in the paper. And so uh, we asked that that person extend it so we could then do it remotely because of a contract. He has a, a contract for purchase, and so he, uh, he asked it, or he said he couldn't. Um, ex extended. So we did ask and try to make it to where we could do that meeting oh, remotely. The, the, the purchaser that is, or the, the it's, a, it's the um, <coughs> office on the east side of McMillan Booth that we you, you asked him to work with the neighbors before, um, but we asked him to move it to a future meeting um, and he declined. So. So, so we have to be here. We have to be here yeah. for that because I hear Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Madam Chair. That wasn't one of the things that was relaxed in the governor's order about uh, public meetings and that kind of thing? No, I mean, it, we're obviously an essential business, and so we're, we're implementing to the extent we can social no, I mean, distancing not, practices. Not but, as far as the essential business part of it, but as far as meetings yeah. in government operations and those kind of things. Yeah. So, I, I defer to Joel on yeah, any, yeah, any legal requirements, this, but... This makes no sense to me. Part of our, part of our concern with the... Um, state of the way the governor's order is drafted is it restricts the movement of people and while it says we can convene to perform this government service it does not recognize the rights of citizens to come here to speak to us publicly that's the concern about in-person meetings uh, beyond all the other concerns that we have um, but I don't you know I read it last night and I don't really see an exemption for citizens to come address us again not the not the governor's order yesterday as far as public movement. I'm talking about, I thought there was a governor's order last week as far as right. government meetings and operations and yes, that kind of thing. Correct. Once we are able to move there and as your administrator was referencing, some of some of the hearings may need to put, be put off because of the notice provisions. So we need to properly notice the meeting as, I'll call it a virtual meeting. Um, we need to properly notice it that way, make the citizens aware of the different ways in which they can participate and we're setting up different options for that. But hearings that, for instance, are scheduled for Tuesday were not noticed that way. They were still noticed. <laughs> but they're not noticed for a virtual meeting. What difference is that? It's yeah. a big difference, actually. Well, I know, I, I'm saying as far as legally goes, and it, uh, that's been opened up to us, that option. It, so it, how are we going to do that going forward? I think going well, forward, it's not a problem. We'll properly advertise any sort of public meeting. hearings for subsequent meetings as a virtual meeting. Again, providing citizens notice of all the different ways that they can participate without being physically present here. Commissioner Long. Yes, um, and with all due respect to the legal issues, <laughs> Madam County Attorney, <clears throat> I think this is a great example of how our laws don't match up with human common sense. This is a national, state, and county emergency people's lives are hanging in the balance and I'm sorry yes I'm an elected official but I am also a human being and a citizen as well and I don't know about any of the rest of everybody but I don't know what kind of an example you think that sets for us as public leaders when we're sitting here with a room full of our colleagues and staff it's nuts, and I beg to differ with you. I'm sorry. There are times in life when you have to use a little bit of God-given common sense, and that's all I'm saying about that. But I can tell you I had enough issues with my family coming here today. I'm not going to get away well, with that again. 
we're setting it up. We will have virtual meetings, um, and again, we'll we'll be ready for that. Um, you know, fall, and we're going to do a practice run after this meeting. Okay, um, they're, they're a little bit different, and so we got we the technology is in place. We're going to be able to do that, and and so we'll have that in place for future meetings. Commissioner but Walsh. oh, go ahead. We're not yeah. done. <laughs> yeah. So you know, I know y'all are working very hard. I know you are using common sense. I, I get that. If there's any possible way, though, that we could have this meeting, this Tuesday meeting virtually, okay. I would strongly support what my colleagues have said. Exactly what Jan has said. We're all here together. And, yeah. I mean. The, the only way I can do that is to eliminate the public hearings that were noticed. Well, what, and so I'm, I'm saying whatever can, you need to do, I think you okay. need to do it because you could lose the entire commission. I mean, that's possible. Right. So the other question I had, and you started talking about it, are we ready from the technology aspect to implement a remote meeting. Um, yes. So, and that's reason we're going to do a, a, a walkthrough after this meeting from your office, and that way we have our technology folks here. We're going to walk through that, um, and and so to make sure that when we go live and we're actually having a meeting, mm -hmm. that it works the way we. Are you looking at audio works. only, like Hillsborough Joan? Are you trying to loop in the video as no, well? No, Is that complicated? Done. Kind of speak to this. Good morning, Commissioners. Don Kroll from the County Attorney's Office. Uh, I've been working with the Office of Technology and Infrastructure and BTS. Um, we have tried to get, uh, first of all, we didn't know exactly what it is you're going to need to consider. So to the extent that you're going to need public hearings and presentations by people who are at some point going to need to do quasi-judicial presentations and things like that, uh, we felt it necessary to give you the option to be able to see those presentations as well as hear those presentations. Um, to the extent that you do video conference, you have to make that available out to the public. They have to be able to see what you see, so on and so forth. Whatever the Zoom platform is what we've selected, as what OTI and BTS have selected, that interaction will be also streamed on our government uh, video channels, so our normal thing that you see on the county's main webpage, which links into a YouTube stream, which will be closed captioned, as well as on the three cable government access channels um, that we have, and, and all of that will be put out uh, in a notice, which will have access to web links online and a phone number people can call to understand how to participate. Uh, the public will be able to uh, again, to the extent they don't need to comment, watch that stream and be able to see all of that. To the extent they need to participate, there will be several options for them to be able to do that that I can go through in great detail later, or we can do that here no, now. Later is fine. Later is great. But it, it, the, the, the short answer is that it will be both video okay. and that, and there will be a recording, unlike what like Hillsborough County did where it's just a call in. This will be recorded and so there will be a record of that of those comments. Okay. Thank you, Barry. So the, qu the question is for these meetings, and are we going to, uh, the, the option is, will be available for residents to call in? You to, bet. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that'll be in place technolo technologically for Tuesday. If, if, we, if, we, if we have a virtual meeting on Tuesday. It would which, be available technology-wise Tuesday. And then I would argue from a legal perspective that we'll have more participation that way than if we have it the other way. Because people can be at home letting us know how they feel about something rather than having to come down here. So I think the spirit I, mm -hmm. of what we're talking about up here is not being violated at all. And I think, in fact, you'll open it up to more people. So just my, my comment on that. And I don't think it would keep us from having a public hearing either. I just think that's, that goes against, completely goes against the spirit of what we're trying to do. Completely. So anyway. Okay. So what we have here today is one... The first thing we, we need to do, and we can do this all at the end because there are several presentations that we have for you this morning. Um, first is to um, extend the emergency order uh, for another seven days and all orders that were entered, uh, such as the closing of pools and things like that. So any orders that we've entered and everything will carry that forward and extend the emergency order for an additional seven days. So that's first. Um, uh, we also want to discuss with you um, the efforts that have taken place thus far. So first I'd like to have Dr. Cho update you on um, the health aspects and what we were seeing, um, trying to give us a base of lay of land where we're at. Um, next, I'd like for the sheriff to discuss the efforts that we've had thus far. We took certain actions. Um, we've been working to enforce those actions. 
um, and he can update you on the compliance and what we're seeing. And then finally, we want to update you on um, the governor's order last night and the practicality of it, of how we see our ability to enforce that and discuss some options with you. So that's kind of the, uh, the first piece of that, and then we can move to other items on the agenda. So first I'd ask for Dr. Cho to come up and give you an update. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> so I'm going to start off by thanking all the community partners that have been working tirelessly to really uh, tackle uh, this uh, pandemic um, and keep, try to keep the public safe. Uh, also, on a personal note, I want to thank all the dedicated uh, public health professionals at the Florida Department of Health in Pinellas County because I, I know from a um, watching them personally that uh, they have put in those types of hours as well. So I do want to thank them and really everybody on the front line of this, including those that work in the essential services. Um, obviously, we're, this is an unprecedented time. This is a global pandemic. Um, and um, what, what we're learning uh, is, uh, as this is a novel virus, that um, it is more infectious than the flu. It is more deadly than the flu, as the data suggests currently. Um, as we also see from the trends, our numbers continue to grow as it is nationally and worldwide. Um, in terms of our numbers, as of yesterday, we had uh, 233 cases that were reported yesterday, which was a 66 uh, a case uh, jump from the, the day prior. prior. Um, we also had um, five deaths that was noted on the uh, report last night, but uh, uh, um, unfortunately we had uh, one that was reported to us late yesterday as well, so we'll have a total of six uh, deaths as of today uh, in an 85-year-old gentleman. Uh, certainly, uh, with the numbers uh, continuing to rise, and can I get the projection? Okay, so some of the things that we're watching is some of the trends. I think that's probably the most important things, what we call the epidemiology curve. Uh, obviously, we watch how Florida is doing overall, and you can see here that the numbers are increasing. And obviously, for, on a local level, we're watching uh, the same trends uh, locally. Uh, sort of seeing that uh, pretty sharp increase. Uh, we're we're continuing to, continue to watch these types of numbers and trends on a daily basis um, to see where we, we peak and hopefully make that turn and flatten that curve. Uh, uh, so I'm optimistic that some of these uh, social distancing policies that we put in place, some of the education uh, that we put out there uh, does eventually bend this curve. Um, so I think on the last meeting, someone mentioned some of the modeling. There's a lot of modeling out there that's being done with the data as to project when that curve is, uh, is going to flatten, uh, when we're going to expect the peak. Um, I, I think at a federal level, they've uh, looked at uh, 11 or 12. Uh, one of the ones that, that keeps coming up is the modeling out of the University of Washington. I don't know if you had a chance to look at that. Uh, I think it was quoted on the last uh, press conference from the federal task force. Um, and it does have that breakdown of when uh, the epidemic is going to peak at a national and, and a statewide level. And uh, if you've uh, seen that model, it does show for Florida that the estimated peak, if everything holds, is about May 2nd. Um, uh, so I'm hopeful, however, uh, with some of the pressure, uh, practices and policies that we put in place locally, uh, that, that the peak is going to be sh um, not as high uh, and that it may be earlier um, to some degree, or um, at least not as high or uh, peak as high. Uh, with some of the practices we put in place. Um, so in terms of testing, we're going to continue to test at the, our Department of Health sites, uh, especially those that meet the criteria. We do uh, have a lot of community partners uh, working on the testing aspect, including BayCare. Um, a lot of the hospitals have developed their own testing uh, capabilities as well or in the process of doing so. So I think we're going to continue to see more and more testing. And with that, uh, uh, we'll also uh, see those uh, increasing cases as well. Uh, uh, to date, we have tested over 3,700 uh, individuals here in Pinellas County, and hopefully we'll see that number continue to grow. Uh, and again, in terms of more of the uh, interventions, the social, social distancing is the only thing we have right now. So I appreciate all the efforts that's been put in to, to enforce the importance of social distancing here in our community. Um, uh, other priorities is really focusing on our vulnerable population, uh, especially those that are at highest risk from developing severe complications, those that are elderly, those with chronic health conditions. 
Uh, so we do, we do a lot of work in the long-term care facilities. ACA has put in a lot of rules as it pertains to visitations, as it pertains to staff members being screened and wearing those protective uh, PPEs uh, when they are uh, on shift. Um, the other thing that we track at the Department of Health is, is cases within the nursing homes and, as well as ALFs. And uh, late yesterday, we did get notified of two cases in two separate um, long-term care facilities here in Pinellas County. They appear to be single at this time, and some of the processes that are put in place includes uh, a joint investigation with our staff and the ACA folks. We go in, uh, look at uh, some of their practices, some of their infection control policies, uh, obviously assess for any other symptoms, and if we were to get other cases within those types of facilities, uh, it moves on to the next phase where we work with uh, state and local partners, including EMS and the fire chiefs, to do uh, more of a, a, a team approach uh, to uh, addressing that. Uh, the other thing that we fo will focus on uh, and continue to focus on is the hospital surge, uh, right? We hope for the best, prepare for the worst. So we, we are, we're preparing to, uh, if we ever get to a point where, where our hospital system is, is overwhelmed, so looking at those things, working with the emergency management uh, on looking at the data um, in terms of their supplies, in terms of their events, uh, in terms of their ICU beds, so we do uh, have, a, have a system in place where we do monitor that. We developed a data group recently just to see uh, uh, that data on a more real-time uh, basis. Uh, we're going to continue to work with the hospitals in, in terms of their surge capacities, uh, looking at starting those discussions. If it were to get past the 100 percent, 150 percent of the capacities, what other alternatives do we have uh, in terms of alternative care, care sites uh, as well as other surge um, activities that do need to be take place um, if we get to that point. Um, and then lastly, um, again, I, I thank everyone for all their hard work, the community partners, from law enforcement, the EMS, the Pinellas County government, to the healthcare professionals, really on the front lines of this. They are working countless hours here in Pinellas County. Uh, and what we ask uh, in return uh, from the public and from the citizens here is to do your part and um, practice social distancing. Um, stay at home uh, when you can. So with that, I'll stop there. Well, if you could extend our thanks to them as well. That's, you know, we know they're out there on the front line and they can't just go home, so we appreciate it. Yeah. Um, thank you, Dr. Cho, and I, I echo the comments about thanking your group and mm -hmm. when you talk to the hospital a group, let them know as well mm -hmm. from us. Um, just a couple of quick questions. Uh, first, um, on the 3,700 tests that you mentioned, right. um, are we getting all of the results now from all of the labs? I know there was some concern earlier in the week that there are labs that they're doing testing and we don't have a handle on the number of tests that they're doing. Right. Or there was that thought, that concern. So we feel better today about getting those results? Those yeah. So, so um, a few things. Uh, it's a good thing that some of these private labs are coming online. It does increase our capabilities. Uh, my initial concern was there was a lot of these smaller labs also coming online. Uh, the, from a public health standpoint, I just wanted to make sure those results were reported back to us on a timely manner. So we're working with that at the state level. Um, we also sent messages uh, to uh, our healthcare community for those that you suspect of having COVID or tested somebody for COVID uh, to notify us as well. So we got that messaging out there as well. Uh, just a couple of other quick ones. Um, how are we doing in Pinellas on, say, you said testing, you said 3,700 tests on a per capita basis kind of compared to other areas. Are we getting, are we high, medium, low? I mean, because obviously if we're low, we're going to see more surge of, right. of, of results probably once sure. we do more tests. Just wondering how we're doing comparatively. So looking at some of the data, and again, it, it's, you take that data with a grain of salt, you have all those private labs, so you don't have a good snapshot of all the, the, the testing that's done at a private lab. So again, taking that with a grain of salt, we are um, uh, um, in the top seven, I believe, in the state when it comes to the testing numbers, if you, if you use that particular report on par, I think, with Palm Beach as of this morning. Uh, but, but again, uh, going back to your point as to how to monitor how we're doing, uh, I would go back to the, the, the trend lines. 
um, because it's obviously we're doing the testing, we're doing the seeing that increase, and we we just continue to watch that trend line and to in terms of decision points uh, uh, and to how to ramp up and ramp down. It's really based on the the incline, but also. Um, looking at where it turns and, and tries to flatten out. And you feel good that we're getting the data from our hospitals now about the, the number of beds they have, uh, yes. ICU beds, um, the reporting on people that may be uh, getting over it and getting to go home, uh, that information we're getting from our our partners? Uh, so I, the, the hospital systems have been great partners with us. Uh, they've been, uh, I mean, I think we've been doing a lot better with that data piece of it. Uh, the, uh, one of the uh, mandates by the pres presidential um, task force for COVID uh, that made it a requirement to report some of those things as well. So we'll, we have different data uh, sets that we can sort of pull down from to get that kind of information. And one last question. Um, over in Hillsborough County, they have set up an operation for folks that may have come down with the virus um, in a family and a place for them to go so as not to infect the rest of their family, right. uh, presuming they, they weren't already infected by it. What kind of setup is that, and do we are we thinking along those lines, or do we have anything like that? Um, okay. So I think um, as there was a report in the paper, we did contract with a, a local hotel uh, for that, um, and we were really targeting homeless population at that group. But that doesn't mean that we can't where where we have requests. Uh, ramp that up because we're also looking at other sites in addition to the one that we have. Okay. So we're monitoring that. We have a we have a group. One of our teams is looking at that okay. and the displacement issues, um, and so we'll we'll ramp that up as needed. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Yes, Commissioner Seal. Um, I know we were given finally a site where we could go through and look at the geographic distribution, but are you? It, it's rather a, a labor laborious um, search because you have to go down right. through each city. Are we starting to map that somewhat so that people know where the hot spots are? So there has been this, some discussions at a state level of, of releasing the zip code level data. Um, I'm not sure what the status of that is. Uh, but what I can, I can tell you, uh, again, I just don't want it to, to send the wrong message where if, if you're not in this particular zip code, um, it, I'm less concerned. I, I would argue that it's, a, it's, spread, it's spreading like a respiratory virus, so it's, it's pretty community-wide. So um, I, 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 I hate to send that mixed message. At the same time, I can see some of the benefits of, of doing something like that as well. Okay. Um, my other question is, um, or comment, or I heard yesterday that Tampa General Hospital has figured out a way to make surgical masks out of um, a, a different material that can also be cleansed and reused. Um, I'll try to get more information for you on that. No, fair enough. Uh, so obviously that's one of our priority areas too with the hospitals. The first thing that we're concerned about in terms of, of the system uh, being overwhelmed is, is our PPE supply chain. Right. So we are continuing to work with our uh, emergency management to, to look at the supplies order when available, uh, but at the same time looking at some of those alternative um, options uh, for those masks. Thank you, Commissioner. So we do have a business working group that is working with many of our local manufacturers. We're looking at a number of different products. The other thing we're doing is we want to test for efficacy to see what level it is most um, proficient for. Uh, we did get approval just the other day on a face shield, and we've already got 15,000 orders in for that. We'll be working on that locally. Uh, we're looking at surgical masks. We are looking at a variety of different levels for those type of products. And we appreciate you sharing that information with us because that way we can you know, look to see if we can uh, work off of those templates and, and find other people. We are working on a, a 3D or trying to get a, a thing for our first responders where they can have an adapter that goes on their SCBA mask uh, and that has a HEPA filter in it. So we are looking at as many creative options as possible. So we do appreciate um, hearing about products like this. Okay. But this is something that could supposedly can go over the N95 mask and then that protects the N95 to be able to be reused. So I'll oh, get you more for information. General. Okay. I look forward to seeing that information. Mr. Walsh. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to make a comment, just a real quick question, but um, I wanted to thank you and Barry uh, for access to the daily 8 a.m. calls. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. And I think the public needs to know that they probably won't hear a lot of questions because those questions have been answered by our participation and listening on those calls. But 
Pinellas County is in such great hands. If they knew the work that was happening with the sheriff and our emergency management, DOH, the school, so many other people, there's a lot of work that's happening every day, 24-7, and our public really needs to know about that. So I wanted to make that statement. Uh, the question I had, Dr. Cho, is you mentioned that you had two ALF cases. Right. Can you speak to, to what happened? Or were those folks moved? And what's the procedure when there's an ALF case? So um, I, I, currently, uh, both individuals are not at the facility. Um, but um, what it does, uh, what in terms of the process, uh, it starts off with the joint assessment um, with the DOH and ACA uh, to to look for those types of parameters to look at that to see that the policy is put in place, and, and based on those findings, uh, we we um, we assess what the next steps are there from there. Um, if, if there are uh, concerns, we are obviously bring in more teams uh, to, um, to do uh, further assessments and or take further action. Okay, but you don't go through a disinfection regimen or no, is there any course. special? So at that facility, yeah, you've that, got that's part of it, reinforcing that testing okay. stuff, um, so reinforcing the sanitizing procedures, uh, reinforcing the screening pieces of it, reinforcing all the rules that, that ACA sort of put in place, the no visitation rules, et cetera. Okay, thank you. Another question for Dr. Chu. Yes, Thank you so much. Just one other comment. Oh, I'm sorry. No, it's all right. Um, I was just following up with what uh, Commissioner Welch said, and that is that um, I really appreciate plugging into those meetings as well. There is a lot of information there. It gives you a sense of knowledge, and it also gives you a sense of, okay, we feel good. We're, we're, and we know that intuitively, but when you hear all of the folks and what they're doing, Communicating to our public, I've said this a couple of times over the last few weeks, and I know others have said it too, there has to be an outward-facing mechanism, and I'm really not speaking, I'm probably speaking around you to the person behind you, but so that we're letting our folks understand what we're doing. The federal level does it almost ad nauseum, and they have many more details that they don't okay. share, but they share a lot, giving people at home a sense of information and comfort. State does it. And the county level, we have a, 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 an information source online, which is pretty good. Mm -hmm. But all we, we have these meetings, and we have that ability to talk. I just think we need to make sure that that outward facing on a daily basis is happening to give confidence to our folks that we are doing what we're doing here locally. Just, just a comment okay, no. on that outward facing communication piece. Okay. Other than in writing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And we certainly can take that back to our communications team, so thank you. Thank you. Did you have something? Well, there, communication is pushing stuff out daily in terms of updates. They're doing a lot through social media. Um, and so Don't I get with the with people want to see like the online channel, but our biggest hits and the most open um, stuff is through our social media outlets. And they are pushing that out daily. So I, you know, I understand your comment, Commissioner. Um, um, but I, just, I don't want to um, downplay the efforts that they're doing to push out that daily communication. Um, and we have looked at media outlets and stuff like that, but our biggest open, our biggest um, um, uh, attraction is through our social media outlets, through, through the data that we have. So. Can I, can I, I have, I have noticed that some, different. if I get on Facebook, people have the information before I even get to read my, my sit rep, so it's kind of interesting. They're watching. Oh, we should watch. Yeah, I just don't want to belabor this, but I think if you look at um, City of Tampa, City of St. Pete, there's like a weekly just a briefing, like a Monday afternoon briefing mm -hmm. from the mayor. Five, ten minutes. Here's what's happening. I mean, if you hit some key points just from one of those 8 a.m. briefings, mm -hmm. you know, here's what we're doing on PPE. Here's what the hospitals are doing to be ready. We're looking at alternative sites. We're doing manufacturing of PPE. Just those kind of points from somebody, Barry, the chair, somebody. I think that's what Commissioner Eggers is saying, and I, I feel the same way. We've been trying to okay. do that independently on our social media, but I think an official county kind of update would be good. We can do it. Okay. All right. One more thing. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, something that I had to chase down yesterday um, that was sought by, kind of sought by the governor's order, but um, there's different information on our website versus the Department of Health's website. So it led to some questioning about spas. And so if we could have the same information on both websites so that it doesn't cause confusion in the public's 
mind and more questions, that would be helpful. We'll look at it. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Morning. 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 Morning, everybody. Morning, Sheriff. Sure. So, um, first thing I want to do is to uh, thank all of the employees of Pinellas County Government, uh, of the Pinellas County Sheriff's Office, of uh, the cities throughout the county, uh, the police departments, the police chiefs, and everybody for their great collaboration, cooperation, and really phenomenal effort in Yeoman's work uh, during this. And also, as you'll see when I get into this, and you'll see a reason for this comment, for the community itself, uh, for the business owners out there, for the people who are patronizing the businesses. And since you all uh, issued that order last week, there has been significant progress. It's not perfect, and there is no perfect. But the businesses, big and small, and the people patronizing those businesses have really stepped up. And you'll see as I go through these presentations, uh, there's evidence of that. And they're working hard to do the best they can uh, in those businesses. Uh, and I'll kind of jump ahead, and you'll see as we go through this, the feedback that I can give you and the feedback that I have from the cities, from the police chiefs uh, across Pinellas County is that if there is an area of concern, and I'm not sure, and ultimately it's for you all to decide, I'm not sure there's anything more that we can do about it. It's in the recreational arena. It's the recreational areas that there seem to be uh, what we're getting the most complaints about and what people seem to have the most uh, concern about. But we'll talk about it. But as far as the businesses go, I want to thank the business community for doing the right thing and for stepping up. So the first thing I'm going to do here is to go through a, a PowerPoint presentation that kind of lays out uh, where we started a week ago. Uh, what we have done, what we continue to do, and what we will continue to do. And then I'm going to play for you a video so you can see for yourselves what it looks like out there uh, on the beaches, on the Spoil Islands, and from a marine perspective throughout Pinellas County. I think it's important for you to have that direct and you form your own opinions based on what you can see. And then I'm going to show you uh, some, again, photographs uh, of and some evidence of what we've seen with uh, compliance. So let's just begin with this first uh, presentation. Uh, we all know that a week ago the order uh, took effect. Uh, it closed, and this is an important thing for people to remember in the order that you all issued. And part of what I'm doing here, obviously, is also to continue this education process to get people to understand what it does. Because, and I'll say this multiple times, I know the administrator will reiterate it, but one of the things that everybody needs to know and as we talk about later about the governor's order that was issued yesterday, his order does not supersede your order in that your order can be more restrictive and your order is more restrictive. So the county's order is more restrictive. So as an example, is that the governor's order that he issued yesterday allows recreational activities. Under the governor's order, pools could be open. Under your order, pools are closed, playgrounds are closed. There are certain things in the governor's order and there were some comments, uh, I think they were first blush comments that were made yesterday by some officials throughout the county that nothing's going to really change. Oh yeah, a lot is going to change under the governor's order. There's going to be a whole, whole lot of businesses that are going to be shut down. There are going to be some significant changes. There's no question about that. So status quo is not where we are come midnight tonight. But your order in section B shuts down, closes unequivocally a whole bunch of facilities. So and the pools uh, are one of those, and, and again, I'll say this because this is a challenge that we're having to people to understand it, is the only thing that can remain open are pools at single family residences, hotels, condos, apartment complexes, etc. And that includes the pool decks, the pools are shut down. So uh, that is a challenge that, that we remain to have. But anyway, the order closed certain places, required that people stay at their homes as much as they can, and it allowed businesses to operate either because they were essential businesses or because they were willing to and did comply with CDC guidelines. So once that order was issued, we immediately began uh, enforcement by, ex by educating the public uh, through the media and through social media. It order, the order directed uh, all the businesses in Pinellas County, all the retail businesses in Pinellas County, uh, to display a sign notifying people of their obligations 
uh, under the order and with the appropriate distancing uh, guidelines. And this was a, a phenomenal effort by uh, over 200 deputy sheriffs and over 50 police officers from some of the police departments in Pinellas County. And in a 48-hour period between Thursday and Saturday, they physically posted these notices on over 14,200 businesses throughout Pinellas County. And they're on the front doors of those retail establishments. And that's a copy of the notice that they physically posted. So 14,000 were actually posted within two days to get the word out. And this is about that messaging. It's about getting people. It's about getting their attention. It's about saying, please help us help you. And I think that this uh, provision was very important. And I think it's been effective. And the feedback that I've received from people is that it has caused movement within the businesses. Because when you get that cop that's showing up, that's posting this and saying, look, you all need to do this, is that it got their attention and it caused people who weren't acting to act. We also uh, developed, uh, in conjunction with the county and the sheriff's office staff, uh, an FAQ sheet. Uh, and each business that received a posting also received an FAQ sheet. The FAQ sheet was also distributed via electronic means, email, and social media, and other means out to people so that they knew what was expected of them. On top of those 14,000 plus notices, deputies also hand delivered over 2,800 closure notices to every single pool in Pinellas County. So whether it's a condo pool, apartment, hotel, uh, every single pool in Pinellas County received a closure notice and those were hand delivered. And we also delivered uh, to 38 golf courses in Pinellas County what we expected of them if they were to remain open as far as adhering to the guidelines and best practices. On Friday of last week, uh, Commissioner Gerard, myself, Mayor Criticus, Chief Slaughter from Clearwater, did a press conference at Clearwater Mall where we posted on some of those businesses again to get the word out and that got good media attention. It's about getting the public educated and getting everybody moving in the same direction. I also produced, and I sent you all copies of it over the weekend, a public service <laughs> announcement that's been posted on social media and on all three zones uh, throughout Pinellas County uh, with uh, Spectrum, uh, that PSA began running this past Tuesday and it's hitting on all the major news channels, Fox, CNN, MSV, MSNBC, and a whole bunch of other channels, again, trying to get that word out. So we are messaging this uh, throughout the community. The uh, posters and all the social media posts uh, gave people uh, a way to report violations and we established a tip line uh, and that number is there, 727-582-TIPS. And this is a, a call center that we set up within the sheriff's office so that people could call to report violations, but also uh, to call with questions and to have answers to their questions. This call center is open from 7 o'clock in the morning until 11 o'clock at night, seven days a week. And this is in addition to the county's citizen information center. So it's an additional call center. As of uh, yesterday at 3 o'clock, the call centers received 460 tips, and we receive about 185 calls a day with questions and inquiries. So it's been pretty active within that call center. Uh, again, it's staffed. We have 18 uh, deputies that are in there, and those lines stay pretty busy uh, with the tips and the, and the calls that are coming in. And in conjunction with getting the word out in conjunction with asking people to provide us with information they're seeing the tips and the violations so if you're going to set that up then you got to do something about it so i established um, compliance teams and uh, teams that would be out there to respond uh, to these complaints and there are over uh, 20 deputies on six different teams uh, throughout the county that are out there every single day uh, from seven o'clock in the morning to eleven o'clock at night to respond uh, to the tips that are coming in, go out, evaluate it, investigate it, talk to the people who are there and determine whether there is a violation, if there is, to remediate it. So how we've set this up is the Sheriff's Office is responding uh, to these tips uh, throughout Pinellas County. It doesn't matter whether it's a contract city, unincorporated area, or a city with a police department, throughout Pinellas County from St. Pete to Tarpon Springs, we're responding to all of those tips uh, throughout the county. I asked the uh, city police chiefs, and they have done so and been great partners for us with this, to in their cities though, is, is to be proactive. 
and to conduct the compliance checks within the city. So we are responding to the tips throughout the whole county, but we are doing the proactive checks in the 13 contract cities and the unincorporated area and the cities that have police departments are proactively uh, doing the checks uh, within those cities. So here's a breakdown for you. Uh, and again, this is as of uh, three o'clock yesterday for the categories of the tips that we have uh, received. So the tips, as an example, as you can see here, uh, two involved golf courses, 17 were gyms and fitness centers, 34 pools, 37 about restaurants. And yes, unfortunately, some restaurants, believe it or not, are having people sit in the restaurants and are still eating in the restaurants. And we've got a couple of pictures for you, I'll show you. Um, you know, all I can say to people is knock it off. Come on. Uh, I mean, that was an order that the governor issued. It's under the executive order. Restaurants are closed. You can do takeout. You can do to go. You can do curbside. But don't push the envelope and put uh, tables in front of the restaurants and have people around the corner in the back and that kind of stuff because it's still going on. And as you all have said, this is serious and people need to take it seriously. Uh, retail was 53. We had uh, no complaints about uh, nail salons, uh, three about hair salons, uh, one about a barber shop, and zero about massage. And then what we're seeing beginning Monday, this is where this really spiked, uh, what the category of non-retail businesses and professional offices. And uh, one subcategory of that that we got a lot of complaints about were call centers throughout Pinellas County, where you had two and 300 people in a room and they're engaged in the call center uh, business. Now, there's so much, and I'll talk a little bit more about this as I go through it, is you have to take these complaints and you have to take everything in context, sometimes with a grain of salt, but you have to be objective about it. And what we found with some of these, uh, the complaints were by uh, disgruntled employees or former employees, et cetera. Uh, we did have some where we need to nudge them, but by and large, as we found out and went out and investigated these, there was an effort being made. Uh, sometimes they need to make a little bit more of an effort, but there was an effort being made to comply. But the call centers are a, a unique situation, uh, but, but is, again, we're finding that they are trying to space out. Now under uh, the governor's executive order, and we're gonna get into this, is that's not gonna affect these call centers. Uh, so as you'll see, and I'm gonna jump ahead here, we're gonna ask you all though, and that's one of the asks we're gonna have here this morning, for these essential businesses, that you all put some teeth in it and make sure that all these essential businesses are required to socially distance. They're required to have that space so that we have some enforcement mechanism and we can, as Dr. Cho keeps saying, and, and he's right, and he reiterates it every morning and he reiterates it every time he does a presentation, the best weapon we have in this is to spread people out. But under the current order, the only requirement under the law that has force of law that we can enforce for social distancing is for those non-essential businesses. So this is where we think that we need to step this up a little bit and give us the opportunity and the ability. If we do have some, because those call centers are gonna stay in operation and some of these other businesses where they got a couple hundred people in one room, that we can force them to spread out if they're not spreading out as we're getting these, uh, these tips. And then 88 were in the other category and that's just a whole miscellaneous group. Now, to break this down for you, um, also is, is that, and it was a big topic, and I understand, rightfully so. Nail salons, hair salons, barber shops, and the massage places. And we identified uh, through uh, DBPR licensing and other resources, we identified 1,104 of those businesses in Pinellas County. So on top of the 14,000 plus retail businesses, on top of the almost 3,000 pools, is that deputies touched, and I'm telling you, they touched twice to make sure this count was right. We touched 1,104 of those businesses throughout Pinellas County to determine whether they were still open or whether they had ceased operations. So I'm not talking closed because somebody went there at 6 p.m. I'm talking about that they had ceased operations. And we touched them twice to make sure. And what we found, is of those 1,104 businesses in Pinellas County that are nail salons, hair salons, barber, massage, or they do multiple uh, service, only 109 are actually operating uh, in some fashion. But as we'll see, it doesn't matter anymore because all those businesses under the governor's order are gonna have to shut down. But I will tell you, and you'll see when I get into this, is, is that, and we tried, and I told the deputies to try, and you'll see pictures of it, all those businesses, because they a lot of it out of desperation just so that they could keep putting food on the table and earning a paycheck for the employees. We could not find a violation. 
When you walk into the, to some of these nail salons, is that they have a chair, two chairs empty, a chair, two chairs empty, a chair. Uh, stylists are wearing masks. They're all distance. We couldn't find a violation. Uh, so that's a credit to them and that they're listening and the message is getting out. But again, it really doesn't matter anymore because as of tomorrow, they're all shut down. Of those 460 tips, deputies responded to 267 <coughs> locations. And we found 49 locations where there were violations and no violations in 218 places. So to apply a percentage to it of all the tips we received, violations were found in only 11% of the locations. And that's a breakdown of where the violations were found. And as you can see, hair salons, nail salons, barbers and massage places, no violations. The biggest one were pools. And to be fair, to put this in context, we didn't start responding to the complaints about pool violations until we knew in the database we established that the pool had been served with a closure letter. So once we knew that they'd been served, that's when we started responding to it. Uh, this is tip response where there was no violations. Uh, again, you can see, speaks for itself. Uh, restaurants were 30. Again, we did have some tips about nail hair and barbers, but there were no violations. And that accounts for the locations by category of where uh, we responded, but we didn't find any violations. So this is a pretty significant number. So in, in addition to touching those 14,000 plus businesses, the almost 3,000 pool notices, touching these 1,100 uh, salons, et cetera, is that those compliance teams and response teams that are out there, the six from the sheriff's office throughout the county, since last Saturday, <clears throat> excuse me, have, have conducted 4,193 compliance checks. So that's a big number, and um, all of those we only found, and that's walking into businesses, that's talking to people, that's taking photographs, that is being as proactive as you can be and touching a myriad throughout the entire county, is that they only found violations at 67 locations. So that's 1.6% of all the compliance checks that we find a violation, and we're looking for violations. The city police departments, as I said, are doing that. Uh, of the city police departments, uh, St. Petersburg reported uh, 55, Clearwater has reported three, and I've confirmed with the police chiefs in all the other cities that they found no violations. I talked to Chief Holloway, I talked to Chief Slaughter, and they concur uh, that the business community is stepping up. They're not finding problems in the business community, and where you do find a problem is, is that it's quickly remediated. And they also concur in my discussions with them late yesterday that the issue, if you will, is in the recreational area. Uh, that's where we're seeing this. You'll see some of this as I go through more of it. Yes, come here. A question about that. I heard yesterday that some, there was a large uh, manufactured home facility that had at least a couple of cases. And I'm wondering if we're doing any specific outreach to like their community centers where they're holding bridge games and bingo and stuff like that. I mean, I know that's kind of farther down the list, but yeah. they do socialize a lot in those communities. Yeah, and, and that now, I mean, you know, well, now they shouldn't be doing that at all because right. under the <clears throat> governor's order, and it's not defined, but under the governor's order, it says that anybody who is a uh, senior citizen must stay at home. It doesn't define that, and it doesn't give any exceptions for it either. Don't be looking at me. So, <laughs> so, so, and and this is why we're going to ask you to do this, Commissioner, this morning, is is that is it would relate to let's say that clubhouse at that mobile home park or wherever it is, and then they're playing. Is is that that doesn't um, now? Uh, there's no teeth in that as far as. Uh, the social distancing requirements are no more than groups of 10 and staying six feet apart. So anything that is able to stay open, and I would s say that that, that clubhouse uh, has to shut down. Uh, I think it already had to shut down, quite honestly, under Section B of your existing order because it talked about clubhouses and fraternal organizations and all that. So um, if it's happening, 
Again, you know, we did over 4,000 checks, but right. we're not getting any calls. If somebody's seeing it, call the tip line. And we'll go out and address it. So anybody that's watching, call the tip line. That's what they're there for. This is what we're trying to do, and we're really trying to. So if anybody's seeing something like that, I think under the existing order, it wouldn't be permissible in a clubhouse setting. Uh, but if you have a bunch of people that are gathered someplace and they're playing cards, there's a whole bunch of reasons why that isn't going to work. Commissioner, just to add to that, so I do have uh, personnel working to reach out to 220 mobile home parks, 1,238 homeowner and condominium association owners, and 1,069 property managers, so we can address that across the board. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Oops. So, overall, uh, again, we're seeing uh, compliance by the retail establishments, and this kind of gives you a, a, an idea of what the deputies are seeing uh, that the retail stores are doing as we're doing <coughs> these 4,000 plus compliance checks. They're limiting the number of people in stores at one time. I think a number of businesses have hired private security, uh, and they're outside and they're lining people up and they're keeping them separated in line, and they're only allowing a certain number of people in the stores. They're closing every other checkout lane in a lot of the retail establishments. Uh, we've heard periodic intercom messages telling people to spread out, uh, and there's a lot of this going on, of marking the floors with six-foot distances, not just in the checkout lines, but in front of deli cases and a whole bunch of other places where people would ordinarily uh, gather. And a lot of signs reminding people of social distancing. Um, staff wearing reminder notices on their uniforms, and some are erecting plexiglass barriers between the cashiers and the customers. Uh, outside pickup lanes and lobby areas with taped off chairs for appropriate spacing. So, Gives you an idea uh, as to, and if you all would, if you could go ahead and queue up the, the video, but don't start it. Um, gives you an idea uh, as to where we've been, where we are, and we're going to continue this because nothing's changed. And if anything, uh, it's going to require more compliance, and I hope not enforcement, but hope, but more compliance because with the uh, governor's order again, and we can get into this later, but. There are a whole, whole bunch of businesses now uh, that are going to have to close their doors. The and so, and, and be clear with everybody is, is that nothing uh, in that governor's order prevents you, as you have already done and may choose to do, to be more restrictive. You can't be less restrictive, but you can be more restrictive. And the existing order is already more restrictive by what you have closed and what you have shut down. So, Sheriff, um, Sheriff one yeah. question. Yeah. Can you be more restrictive? in what they identify as an essential service? Yes. Okay. You can always be more restrictive. You can be more restrictive than what the uh, state order says. It's it, it, it specifically in there that it doesn't prevent anybody, for, any uh, local governmental entity from being more restrictive. So okay. you just can't be less restrictive. So in other words, under uh, the governor's order right now, your order is less restrictive because it allows, as an example, uh, bookstores to remain open. Right now, under your order, jewelry stores can remain open. Right now, under your order, uh, furniture stores can remain open. The governor's order doesn't allow that. So your order is well, no, right. superseded. Um, because that's say Trump, but that's probably not a, a <laughs> um, it's, it's, use the man's name, I didn't mean to, but um, is that it's superseded, okay, by the governor's order. So it because is. It's, it is it, it's, because the governor is more strict. Correct. So, yeah. so it, it's preemption, really. Is, is that? It, and he has said that he has preempted you, and you have to comply. His is the baseline. You can not be more lenient, but you can be more restrictive. So you can be more restrictive. You just can't be less. So the example is, is, is that you can not not allow furniture stores, bookstores, jewelry stores, hair salons. You can't allow them to be open anymore. Okay. But if you said, as an example, um, there was a particular business that is uh, deemed essential, but you wanted to shut it down, um, you could. So here's an example, and this is going to come up, is, is that religious churches. Mm -hmm. In the governor's order, it says that all churches, synagogues, religious institutions can be open. And it doesn't require in there, it doesn't require in the governor's order, by rule, by law, social distancing in churches. So what we're going to ask you to do is anything that is essential or anything that he's allowed to remain open that you require 
that be groups of no more than 10 and there be social distancing so that um, so that's an, an example of being more restrictive. Make sense? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. Let me clarify just one, one particular issue because we got into essential non-essential. But the governor's order, what it did is it restricted people's movement. Um, so it's, it's it, because I know people are watching, they're going to say, well, it didn't specifically do that. But in <laughs> essence, it did. Because what it said is, you can leave your house, but you can't go to that bookstore. <laughs> it said you can only go to essential services. That, and so by defining that, so we, we're looking at it and saying, well, then how can a non-essential business stay open if, in fact, nobody's allowed to go there? You know, so it's a different way of looking at that, and that's the reason that we're going to bring forth a set of recommendations in terms of uh, the practicality of the order and how we can actually enforce it. So just for a, a little clarification in, yeah, no, in terms so, so, of, of how the, how we're looking at this. So, so this sound, sounds whatever it is, but here, you give me an example. Is is at a barber shop under the governor's executive order? It, it, it closes no businesses. If somebody wanted to, and they wouldn't. But this is by way of illustration. If that barber shop wanted to leave its door unlocked and leave an open sign on the front, they could. Seriously, because it doesn't close any businesses. But because it's not essential, no employees could leave their house to go work there, and no patrons can leave their house to go to the barber shop. So, again, what we're going to say is let's close the loop, let's be complete, let's close the circle on this so that people can't leave their houses to go to those, but also let's close the circle and make it easy on us for enforcement and make it easy for people to understand. So let's close those non-essential businesses as well. So that's an example where you can do that. So you can go, anything that's not essential is, not only can you not travel, but they're closed. So that's what we're gonna ask you to do. So, it, it, and, and the administrator is absolutely correct, is that the governor's order doesn't shut anything down. It leaves everything open, but you can't travel to get there it, to work or to patronize it. That's crazy. That's a good question. That's what it, it makes does. makes no sense. Can you, yes, please. He just wants to be able to say he didn't shut any businesses down later. Well, because, never mind. Commissioner Welch. Thank you, Madam Chair. So we've got the governor's order in Granicus, but these recommendations that you're referring to, That's do we? come up uh, in a minute. We have copies for you. Okay. Do we have an electronic copy? We will. Yeah, I just want to be able to do electronics it. today. So. Okay. <laughs> okay. Hot, hot off the press. We were working on it in the last hour. I get it. <laughs> so what I'd like to do now is to uh, is to show you the video, and then I have one more PowerPoint uh, presentation on the backside with some photographs. So this video is so I've had the uh, helicopter up uh, and the airplane up, and we have been flying at least twice a day, uh, morning and in the afternoon. And this is a compilation video uh, that begins on Saturday. As you'll see, it's going to show you some side-by-sides and some differences from Saturday to Sunday. And it's going to show you Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, into Wednesday. Last Friday, under an executive order, FWC requires that all vessels on the water remain at least 50 feet apart and that there be no more than 10, person on a boat, 10 people on a boat. Um, most people, when they hit the water on Saturday, were not aware of that. And Saturday's pretty ugly out there, to tell you the truth, and you'll see this for yourselves. And it shows the, the, just the amount of people, the amount of boats, and that they weren't properly distanced. And that's at Three Rooker, that's at the Spoil Islands, that's at uh, Shell Key, it's throughout the waterways. Um, I got with the administrator, <clears throat> we put signboards out uh, at all of the boat launches throughout Pinellas County, all the boat ramps. We got the cities to do that, and we blasted out uh, through electronic means through the phones to educate people on this. We got it out. I did a couple media interviews. We saw it better on Sunday uh, than it was on Saturday. Uh, and what we've seen, and you'll see in the video, what we see you know, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday it, it is really not a good example because it's always lighter during the weekdays. Uh, this weekend will uh, let us know uh, it, it, if we're continuing to make progress. I can tell you that we have every single marine asset that we have uh, on the water uh, between the Sheriff's Office, the City Police Departments, and FWC at one point last weekend we had about, uh, we had 15 boats on the water. 
that's it. I mean, we're that's all we got. So as you see this, you know, I'm going to say right now, if one of your questions is, well, can you do more? The answer is no. We are maxed out. We've got two two deputies on every boat. We are we've got every resource that we have out there to try and address this. And again, we just need to put the public's help with this. So. Why don't I uh, play this and then any questions you have. So I may stop it in a couple places, but is you, we'll just go ahead and play the video. As you can see here, and you can look, uh, this is Saturday in the noon hour, and this is Clearwater Beach. Bel Air Beach, Indian Rocks Beach. So you can see, and this is one of the challenges, and we knew this. I mean, this is a beach for a Saturday at this time of year. There's people on it, but it is extremely thin. And as you can see there, that the people that are on it are down there in that high water line area primarily. Uh, they are spread out. Uh, most of them are walking, uh, but again, that's uh, about noon or so on Saturday with Indian Rocks Beach. Uh, obviously it would be packed if the beaches weren't closed. We're down in Reddington now by the pier, uh, John's Pass. This is Saturday now, so you know that's what uh, one of the spoil islands look like. Um, you know, the, some of those boats are spread out, but you got a lot of people down there. St. Pete Beach coming up to trade winds. Those chairs, most of them are empty, but there's still some people out there. Again, that's private. Hotels have done pretty well, it looks like. They are, yeah. So there, there's been, I mean, overall, there, people are making an effort. There's, there is compliance, there's no question. And you still see some people out there, but we know we've got that area, that the high water line area, et cetera, and the private land that's out there. Uh, but overall, I, I think it's, it's thin, and we're not seeing any... Uh, big groups. You, you, sure, you see three or four, and then you look at them, and they're family members. Um, or we even sometimes go up to them, and it's one family. And then the closest people uh, to them are 50 feet apart or whatever it is. So there, there's good spread out there uh, as far as this is concerned. We, we've, we've definitely accomplished, uh, I think, what we set out to accomplish as far as that's concerned. So now we're down to St. Pete Beach, uh, Shell Key. This is Outback Key. Outback Key is a little bit thicker uh, at this point on Saturday. Again, most of these people are not aware of the 50-foot uh, regulation because they hit the water before it was publicized. But still, a lot of them, I mean, those two boats are 50 feet apart. So now we're at Three Rooker. Mm -hmm. And Jeez. for those of you that are familiar with Three Rooker, that's empty compared to what it normally is. A Three Rooker is normally jam-packed. That is very, very light for Three Rooker. And again, you're going to see, and some of these are not compliant, but this is Saturday uh, before we got it out. Does the governor has says something about congregating in public places just that you're watching this. How does that relate to, I'm talking about parks and these kind of places too. I mean, that's not compliant. I mean, you can't, I mean, you know, it, it, again, but some of this is, is, is difficult too in that if you have four or five people and that's one family in it and then you've got six feet apart, four or five people and it's another family in it. And then you've got a group of three over here, even if they're not the same family unit, but it's groups of 10 and they're six feet apart. It can look like you got more, but it's still not a violation. Yeah. So, you know, and, um, and that's some of the challenges we have in the complaints. And I'll talk a little bit about that when we get into, into this, because uh, what, unfortunately, what people are thinking is that in uh, the pier in Dunedin, and I'll explain what happened there and what we did, and why the optic, I get the problem with the optic, 
but it's not a violation uh, because people are thinking, like as an example, on the pier, there shouldn't be more than 10 people on the pier. That's not what it says. It doesn't say that. And it doesn't say more than 10 people in Publix. So if you got, you know, in the aisle, at one end of the aisle, you've got mom and dad and three kids. Well, there's five, and at the middle of the aisle, you've got the same thing. The other end of the aisle, you've got the same thing. And then that next aisle over, you got the same. That's not a violation. And, and so th this, though, on three rucker on Saturday, I mean, I'll, let me keep playing. You'll see. I mean, We should also tell people not to take the whole family to public at the same time, too. There you go. <laughs> it is. I mean, it's, or it's impossible. And I'll say it again, you guys, know, you all know this, is, is that all, all of what you do, I do, what anybody does, is also limited by what the public is willing to do. Yeah. And, that, and that's, a, that, that's a limit of that. And, of course, the other bookend is, is that what we are able or willing to enforce. So, yeah. you know, it, it, I, I think that we've made great progress. I, I really do. I think that what has been implemented here, as you'll see and you are seeing, uh, is significant, not perfect. It's never going to be. Bob, on the uh, on that social gathering essential activities, it talks about local jurisdictions shall ensure that groups of people greater than ten are not permitted to congregate in public space. So, definition of public space would be to me like a pier, no more than ten on a pier, or at Weaver Park, no more than ten at Weaver Park. So, I'm just wondering that interpretation and how you know. That's the problem with it, Commissioner. You you can read it that way, and I can also read it. You know, is is that is that no more that people aren't allowed to congregate in a public space. And you can congregate, okay, as long as you stay in groups smaller than 10 and you stay six feet apart. So you could read that the way you're suggesting, or you could read it is, is that you have to have, on the pier, you have five here, six feet apart, five here, six feet apart, five here. It, 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 it's not. That's the problem. These groups don't freeze. They all move around and True. they're mobile and fluid. And so True. there's, there's, so, there's, so, you know. So as we get to the Dunedin issue, is that I spoke with the mayor several times, and I believe what Dunedin is going to do uh, is to close the pier uh, from Friday through Monday uh, to eliminate the problem of the weekends. Uh, they're also going to close Weaver Park. But why are people there? People are there because they're watching the sunset. So you can close the pier and you can close Weaver Park. They're just going to go somewhere else. So that's and they can be more restrictive as well. Yes. Than we are. So, yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, t to a degree, okay. uh, unless the county administrator decides to supersede that. I mean, so it, there, there are limits on that. Too. Okay. So that's a big shot, uh, three rooker. So now we're about three o'clock on Saturday. Um, Clearwater Beach on Saturday, again, in that three o'clock hour. And people are showing up in boats. They're getting on that wet sand. Again, Clearwater Beach. Is that the north end? Yes. <clears throat> the pier. You know, all that public beach is, is empty. Yeah. Except for some of those, that, you know, we're now down in San Key. Bel Air Beach. You know, a lot of this is private property where the condos, apartments, hotels. We're down in Reddington now. So now John's Pass, and to get those spoil islands uh, to the uh, east of John's Pass in the in the drawbridge in there. So I was down there, I was out all day Saturday and Sunday, I was down there uh, Saturday afternoon around this time and looking out, stopped on top of the drawbridge, looking out to the east. 
there are a lot, a lot, a lot of boats, and they weren't spaced properly, and we knew we had a problem. This is where I talked to the administrator, and we knew we had to do something differently for Sunday. So, and this is where we put more resources and assets. So the next thing you're going to see here as we move into Sunday, you'll see a difference. It's better on Sunday. So this is Saturday. So is that just a result of people not knowing, you think? Yeah. Well, well, there was no... A uh, specific requirement on the waterway until FWC issued the order mm -hmm. that boats stay 50 feet apart and that there be no more than 10 people on a boat. So when these people were doing what they were doing on Saturday, that order had just been entered, uh, I believe it was Friday or late Thursday, and it hadn't been publicized at all. So nobody knew of those requirements. So it, they hadn't been educated on it and, and weren't aware. So they were doing this with other the premise <clears throat> that they could act as they wanted to and there were no regulations. So now we're down to Treasure Island. <clears throat> St. Pete Beach again Saturday afternoon, back by trade winds again. And now we're going over to Shell Key on Saturday afternoon. By the afternoon is when it, it thickens up, there's no doubt. Uh, you saw Shell Key earlier on Saturday morning. Um, and you'll see Outback Key here in a second. And you know, no doubt that there's a lot more people out there. certainly begs the question about the the move um, on community pools and you know restricting that and yet the, the closeness that I mean I'm not saying that these are constrained pools but they right. certainly are people being close to each other right um, so now we're back on Sunday okay so we're in three rucker and so it's in the morning first of all and, and now this is after all the information dissemination Blasting it out over the phones, the signboards were out, we got the media, so we're pushing it out. Uh, this is Sunday morning up at Three Rooker. We'll come back here in a minute, you'll see Sunday afternoon, and it is better. Um, North Cal, DC. Clearwater Beach. Honeymoon's closed. Are they approaching honeymoon from the water? Some. Some, yeah. So we're back in John's Pass now again. But again, remember, this is that same spoil island area you saw that was pretty dense from Saturday. Uh, but it's in the morning. So we'll come back to the afternoon here. And, um, but people are trying. So now, okay, so here's uh, Gandhi. Here's the deal with Gandhi. This, it, these images, Gandhi on Saturday uh, and Sunday uh, was a mess. And under your order, because of the high water line issues and the state roads and the DOT and all that that's out there is, is that none of what you all did applied to Gandhi. Uh, and so it, we, we were monitoring it. And quite honestly, people ruined it for themselves. Uh, and I personally went out there on Sunday and I shut it down. Uh, and it's shut down and it's staying shut down. There is a provision in Florida law under Chapter 30 that allows a sheriff to shut down any beach, recreational area, et cetera. And I use that and we're not reopening it. I got three deputies out there all the time because it was a disaster out there. It was beer cans flying everywhere and people were partying, they were not adhering to any of this, they were all over each other and it was just a mess out there. So you know, we tried and this is an example is, is that <laughs> these rules are in place, the guidelines are in place, the directives are in place. We said to people, help us help you. 
but if you don't and you're going to force us, we're going to take action. And so what you're seeing here is really nothing compared to what it was because the helicopter got there after we already started. You'll see the cruisers on the ground and we were there with lights on and it shut down. So it's going to stay out there with deputies out there every single day. And I'll show you what it looked like uh, yesterday out there, a huge difference in this. So Gandhi, for everybody, don't go there, and, and it shut down. What and, was and the average age group, Sheriff? Pretty much, I, I'd say, well, it was, it, was, it was mixed. I'd say average, probably uh, 20s and 30s. I'd say probably late 20s and 30s. Um, and, and there were some, and unfortunately, I mean, I personally told some people to move, you know, a, a father out there with his two kids. And sorry, uh, but everybody else ruined it for you. So it, and there was a lot more who were not doing it the right way than who were. So um, we just can't have that. Uh, what was going on out there Sunday was not acceptable. Sheriff, you just mentioned a, a few ruining it for the many. Um, as it relates to enforcement and fining people, um, I know we haven't done a lot of that. I mean, obviously the job is just insurmountable, I'm sure. But are you finding opportunities, and I say that in the worst way, uh, that, that require fines? Um, no. That, okay, so you're, you're, you're not seeing that as a, a need. You have that leverage and tool. We do. Yeah. We do. Per occurrence, uh, right? Is it per occurrence? Yes. Okay. And, and you'll see when I get into the businesses especially, you know, I commend the businesses. Yeah. I think yeah. they've done a great job, and people are really trying. They really are. Um, you know, w with this is that, yeah. you know, <laughs> It so overran kind of a, kind of a, 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 a whatever, uh, is that uh, one of our sergeants was out there. He's kind of a big guy, and there was a um, <laughs> guy that said, I'm not leaving. And we told him to move on. And he said, you're leaving uh, the easy way or the hard way. And he said, okay, I'll go the easy way. So, I mean, you know, if, we, if people are going to force us, don't, don't play. You know, and so I don't want to do any of that. No, That's not my intention, no. uh, and, and don't want to do it. Uh, but if they force us to, uh, then uh, we'll do what we got to do. But we haven't had to do any of that, and, uh, yeah, and, I, and I hope we don't. Uh, that's not the, 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 that's the... That's the idea behind it, is that we don't want just a few people to end up ruining it for everybody. So mm -hmm. you kind of... Right. That enforcement piece is really important. So, right. Well, you can see here, look at this, with all those cars. And again, this is thinned out from what it was, the, because the helicopter got there after, after we started moving them out. Um, but you can see, I mean, it's just like business as usual out there. And I mean, the amount of beer cans and bottles and everything all over the place. There's a cruiser with its lights on. I mean, they're clearing people out um, and moving them on. But you know, this is just to show you, but th this won't happen again because it's shut down. But to your point, that's the way it could end up being out on the waters if the boats resort or go back to, I guess, um, to the old. Yeah. yeah. So, so you can see, I want to show you this. So there's a side by side. So there's Saturday about three o'clock at three Rooker on the left. And there's Sunday about same time, four o'clock at three Rooker. So I, I have a couple in here. I'll show you side by sides between Saturday and Sunday. Um, and it's better on Sunday. So people are listening. They're, they're trying. <laughs> yeah, better, but still a lot of them there aren't 50. At right. All. No. No. Yeah. You're. And you know. In this weekend, will probably be a, a, another indicator for us because we didn't really get it out until Sunday. You can't judge it during the week, and then right. we're going to come into this weekend. And we'll have maximum uh, marine assets out there again. So I think you'll have a better read after this weekend. Yeah, I think I think West Palm, Broward, and Dade they they couldn't control it, so they ended up closing all the marinas, and that's not something we want to do. Right. So hopefully this weekend, folks will adhere to what we're asking them to so that we don't even have to consider that right. um, option. I agree. So again, it's just a side by side for you. You can see how much thicker it is on Saturday. Well, you still got people out there, but you know, that's okay. I still think that the uh, spirit of what we're trying to do at the state level and here, there is, like you said, it's so much better, but there's still m multiple violations here. People are not, mm -hmm. right. you can tell, not taking it seriously. So there's a difference. Like Saturday, again, John's Paso those spoil islands. That Saturday's the left, Sunday's to the right. Uh, it's better, but still, you know. I mean, that's... <laughs> 
hopefully it'll be better this weekend. Hopefully this is helpful for you all to be able to yeah. see it this way, so, uh, Ed. Yes. You get, feel, you know, you, you get the, you judge it for yourselves. Yeah, you can't put the little tape on the floor <laughs> out right. there to, well, to keep people 50 feet apart. Water. Right, yeah. sand or the water, you know. Yeah. So here we are back at Outback Key again. You look at Outback on the left on Saturday, and, and Outback was better on Sunday. So again, now now look at three worker on Monday. That's what I'm saying is is that you, you really can't compare the weekdays to the weekends because that's about noon Monday, and you got honeymoon. We'll move through some of this now a little bit more quickly. Uh, we're down into uh, Clearwater Beach, Sand Key. Remember Sand Key from over the weekend, and there were a lot of people out there, but now it's you know it's empty. Bel Air Beach. Back down into the Reddingtons. And so there's John's pass. Yeah. Remember, that, remember what that looked like a second ago? So that's the difference between Saturday, Sunday, and, and Monday out there. Um, I mean, it's really windy, too. Down into Treasure Island. Mm -hmm. St. Pete Beach by the trade winds again. Shell Key. Outback Key. Monday. So here's a difference for you. <laughs> wow. There's Gandhi on Sunday, there's Gandhi now. And until you all lift the emergency order, <laughs> that's where Gandhi's staying. So it's. It's done. We will not have another problem out there. So I thought, and another thing for people, look, on the, clear, on the uh, Courtney Campbell Causeway, where they're having problems, and, and I was out there myself, and Clearwater's uh, doing a great job of keeping a, an eye on it, staying on top of it. What people are doing on the Courtney Campbell is that it's closed, but they're parking on the side by the guardrail, and they're hopping over the guardrail uh, to go out there. Come on, you know, uh, that's so, it, you know, Clearwater's dealing with that. Like I said, I was out there myself and moved some people along. And, but this is where they're just not complying with that. And, and you can't be parking on the side of Courtney Campbell. It's, one, it's dangerous. Uh, and two, don't be hopping the guardrail and going out there. So now we're going to show you some pools. Um, and, you know, this is Monday. You can see some of these pools. Uh, some people are in the pools, um, and but by and large, by and large, there's compliance. Uh, but you, of course, you're going to have some that just aren't, and we get the complaints. And all these places got paid visits. Uh, that's one in, in whoops. Well, you can see that there's a lot of people in that pool down there in in the rocks. I'm going to show you some inland pools too in St. Pete. Uh, there's a co couple in a pool there. Uh, as we move up the beach Monday afternoon, Cala DC. Back to honeymoon. And again, three rooker, but that's it's not the weekend. So. Just got a couple minutes left. So back to Gandhi on Tuesday, as I said. <clears throat> so now we're going into downtown St. Petersburg, uh, just looking at pools, uh, some of the parks. Again, compliance, there's nobody out, they're shut down. Bayway. Fort Soto. Mm -hmm. Tuesday back at Three Rooker. Fort 
Clearwater Beach Tuesday afternoon, Delaware Beach. Some people in Delaware Beach in their pool. John's Pass, back at the islands again. Down in Treasure Island. Outback Key. So we got about a minute to go. We're almost finished. Um, again, Outback on Tuesday. Yandy. Big difference. <laughs> Island Park. Uh, this is a CVS on Olmerton Road. You can see where people are spaced and they've got tape on the floor and people are staying six feet or more apart. Uh, this is a family dollar store on Belcher Road. Again, tape on the floor where people are staying apart. Uh, the Golden Diamond Source now, unfortunately, that's a business that's got to close now. Uh, so they put people outside. They had a security guard outside. Uh, they were only allowing, I believe, 10 people in the store at a time, keeping them spaced out. But that's a big effort on their part, and they should be recognized for uh, making that effort uh, to uh, adhere to, strictly adhere to the rules. Um, you can see, again, we saw this. These are, of course, samples. You can see the line uh, that was established for people outside the store. Home Depot is only allowing a certain number of customers in the store at a time, and their employees are uh, wearing reminders on their uniform stay six feet away. Um, Jersey Mike's on Roosevelt Boulevard, compliance, people can go in, take out, but all the chairs and tables are put away. Um, Michael's Craft on 66th Street in St. Pete, um, good spacing, people are waiting outside to get in. Here's another one, uh, surf shop on Gulf Boulevard. Uh, people have to wait for staff prior to entering. They have to get permission to enter. They have a table set up outside, etc. Subway, uh, Sun Boulevard, tape on the floor. People are spread out. Pet store, same thing on US 19, Clearwater. Gas station at uh, Thornton's Gas Station on Tampa Road. Uh, True Value Hardware Store, same thing. This is on the 28th, about 1.30 in the afternoon. Walgreens has signs up reminding people, stay six feet apart, put tape on the floor, keeping those customers spread out. Same thing here, another, another view of Walgreens on US 19. So this is an example of one where we did see where they were not compliant, this advanced discount auto part. Uh, those people are too close together. They really weren't making an effort in there. Deputies talked to them. But I can tell you that there isn't any business where we found a violation that we talked to them that they didn't say that they were going to fix it and get it right. Uh, they're all uh, cooperative once they were talked to about it. Uh, and um, we're starting to track now any repeats that we get. And uh, there won't be a lot, I can tell you. Getting back to your point, Commissioner, there won't be a lot of repeat conversations. Uh, you know, do it, <laughs> fix it. If you don't fix it, then we'll have to have a different kind of conversation. Another one, this is a Publix on Gulf Boulevard. Those people are too close together. The, the spacing isn't there. This is from the 28th at about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. So that would, be a <clears throat> that would not uh, be what we want to see as a violation. Here's an auto auction, uh, your, your auction, excuse me, on Shearer Drive. That's just way too many people all gathered there in one place. <clears throat> and that was um, yesterday, about 20 or 4 in the afternoon. The pools, like I said, most of the pools that we see, most of them are in compliance. You saw some, of course, from the helicopter. You saw both. Some were and some were not with people in them. But by and large, people are putting signs up. They're fencing them off. <clears throat> They're picking up the chairs. Uh, some are chaining the chairs so people can't use them, that type of thing. More signage with the pools. Grand Shores on Gulf Boulevard. Taped it off with yellow tape so people were reminded not to go in. Lake Tarpon Lodge shut down signage. 
Same thing here on the Pinellas Bayway at Palm, Palm Island. Sandalwood Beach Resort, Golf Boulevard, signs reminding people it's definitely closed. Stonegate Apartments on US-19 in Palm Harbor, same thing. You got another one, Villages at Lake Tarpon. Dolphin Point Apartments. This is a violation, Reddington Shores. You can see the people out there in the pool and by the pool. So they were all told to leave and we haven't had any further problems there. Um, to give you an idea, this is Dunedin Causeway. Uh, this was on the 28th at about one o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, people are on the trail. Um, give you an idea as to what that looked like. Uh, all up and down Gulf Boulevard, I just threw one in here, but all the beach access areas are closed. That's pretty much what they look like with the signs that the county uh, created at the administrator's direction and the beach closed signs. That's all up and down those beach access points. That's just it gives you an example one in Indian Rocks Beach at 18th Avenue Beach Access. Golf courses, we're out there checking them. Uh, by and large, it's one person to a cart. Um, they're wiping them down, they're spacing them out, the golf courses uh, are complying. Playgrounds, same thing, we're checking all the playgrounds because remember those are closed. Um, there have been some uh, where people have got complaints but by and large from out there checking them, this is Marshall Street Park in Safety Harbor and it shut down, uh, there's tape around it and people are abiding by it. Philippi Park, same thing. County Park. <coughs> Wall Springs Park. Palm Harbor. So this is what we're seeing, and like I said, we tried. We did, I'm telling you, we tried to find violations in these nail salons, hair salons, et cetera. So of... this is Casablanca uh, on 4th Street in St. Petersburg. And we walked in there, and deputy immediately took a photograph, and that's how they're doing business. They're spread out. You got. Uh, two people in there and you can see one's at one end, one's at the other. But this doesn't matter anymore because they're shut down as of tomorrow. Right. Same thing here with this uh, barber shop on 66th Street in St. Pete. We got one person in there, the stylist is wearing a mask, wearing gloves. Uh, this is Lavish in Company Hair Salon on 22nd Avenue North, same situation. Uh, another hair design place on Park Street in St. Petersburg. This is that new image nail salon where you can see where they're spaced out. You got one person too open, one person too open, one person too open. So they're definitely more than six feet apart. Right. Well, if we're gonna, can we kind of speed? Yeah, I'm going to have many more. Done. Yep, that's it. Oh, that's it. Right. We're done. Great. This is a this this is a call center that we got a complaint about. This is the point of this one is is that we're getting complaints about the call centers. And when we went in. This is what we found, and they were actually in compliance with this one. Hmm. Well, the last thing, the last thing here is these are photographs that uh, Mayor Bojowski from Dunedin sent me. Commissioner Eggers, this is the pier, and as you see, and you look at it there, and what happened was there is is that uh, the concern was is the deputy went got the call, went out there, uh, talked to the people on there, and found that they were family groups. Just the whole scenario we described. So you got. Four or five people together, they're one family. Then six feet apart, another family. And so there was no violation there. People say, well, that's a bad optic. Well, it is what it is. Another one is that, and I don't have a problem with it, and maybe you do, but people were complaining because you got a man and a woman who are playing Frisbee by themselves uh, there on the causeway. I mean, if they're by themselves and they're out there recreating and playing Frisbee by themselves, and people say, well, they shouldn't be out there, well, uh, I don't have a problem with that. Uh, and I, I, I do not see that as a problem. Um, there's nobody else around them, and they're by themselves playing a frisbee. So those are some of the calls that we're getting. As you know, Commissioner, we got calls in Philippi Park last week, and we went out there and checked it. And the, the complaint was, there's all these people in the park. Well, yeah, there were a lot of people in the park. Uh, but the closest deputies found that people were together was 30 feet. And the largest group was nine people, and they were all one family. So again, we've got to keep all this in perspective, uh, is that this isn't creating a sterile environment. So I'm done. Great. Yeah. I have a question. Yes, please. 
Um, Sheriff, I only saw in your examples one <clears throat> example of a Publix, and I know that on my email coming in, that seemed to be an issue with the public stores. Have you looked at more than one? Yeah, we have. There's actually several public stores in there. Believe it or not, I was trying to go through it kind of fast, but uh, <laughs> there are actually several. There are several in there, and some of the public stores, uh, there was one in there we gave you an example of no compliance, one or two, there were no compliance, but a whole bunch where there was compliance. Okay. So, no, and we are definitely hitting the, the public stores, the Winn-Dixie's, the Home Depot's, the Walmart's and all. Again, we have done, you know, over 4,000 compliance checks, and, and we're hitting them all, and we'll continue to do that. Good. Thank you very okay. much. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thank you. So, commissioners, um, you know, as you can see, the efforts to try and work within the orders that you created last Friday were, were largely successful, you know, depending upon, you know, individual interpretations, you know, of that. But that, that all changed yesterday, you know, from the governor's order. Um, we worked with, uh, I, I was talking with Mike Merrill and um, over in Hillsborough County and, and down in Sarasota County and trying to, <laughs> over between 4 o'clock yesterday and this morning, try to interpret, you know, how are we supposed to interpret this order. And, and it really gets back to what I said before. Um, it, we believe that some of these small businesses, if they could stay open and continue to earn a paycheck, and they were taking all these reasonable measures, you know, was okay, but the governor's order says that you can't go to non-essential business. Um, and so by that very nature, there's really no way to enforce it without having an order saying that we close non-essential business. So um, the, other, the other piece that we have is we're concerned about, um, let me just get to this, that even if you are an essential business, that you take every, you know, to the maximum extent possible, you take efforts to adhere to the social distancing guidelines. So even if you are, in a, you know, Sheriff showed you a picture of the call center. Let's, let's take, even if you're an essential business, you have to stay open. Your financial services, your, and there's a lot of essential businesses that are listed in the governor's order, um, that you take every ex effort possible to do that. So in light of that, we are going to ask for a, um, an additional order from you that would say any retail, um, business, operation, or organization not included in the category as essential business um, must close. So that would be the first action that we would ask. Do we have that? I've the second. It it's emailed. It. It's emailed to you. I've got it electronically. Yeah, we, we, we emailed it up and we actually have. He's got all the copies. They gave it to me. I forgot to hand it down. Yeah. <laughs> Let's give us, we'll just pass it on. Okay. I got it. Thank you. Thank you. Question. Yes, please. So, uh, if you're a non-essential business, a barber shop, right? That's a non-essential business according to the governor's order, right? So if you are in that shop, you are violating the governor's order and be sanctioned to any penalties for violating the governor's order, correct? As, a, as an individual. Well, you can't, if you're the barber, you can't go in there either. That's correct. So nobody should be in that business. And I feel like we're playing semantics with and that's why I, I, when we talked last night, I, yeah. I didn't know if you had a chance. To, and I know there's 67 counties in the same dilemma trying to figure out exactly what this means. That's correct. And so did the governor's office give us any clarification overnight? No. <laughs> and, and so. And we attempted to get that, but yes. <laughs> you know, I always want to give the person the reasonable doubt and the chance to clarify what they said. But it just feels like they wanted to say, well, I never shut any businesses down, you know. <laughs> and it's semantics and it's language and it's and it's. We're in a too serious a time for people to be playing games with language. And that's what's so frustrating from when we saw this yesterday till this morning. Well, the, and I think that the, the reason that we're coming forward with this order today is because we want to get clarity. Um, we, need, we need adherence to um, the 
um, practices that we're, we're asking people to do. And so ambiguity is, is what's going to really hurt us. And so with that, that's the reason we, we're recommending that you take this additional action. So it would say if you're not a central business, you must close. If you are an essential business, to the maximum extent possible, you adhere to social distancing guidelines. And then third, that the county administrator, in addition to the previous powers you granted, um, that I have the ability to close any um, non-essential um, issue specific orders um, where for essential businesses where they're not in compliance. Um, so that we, we say you gotta take this seriously. Um, and, and I'm actually reading this, we need to look at that. Um, but, but the idea being that we take this seriously, we do everything possible because we have a window of time period in which to act um, and that we move and we act appropriately. Did I, I just so that we're clear, did I hear you say that you wanted the ability to close essential businesses if they're not in compliance? That if, if they're... Because the language says not essential. It says it's not essential. Yeah, no, I, I clarify we that. We already have that in the It question. says clo to close non-essential businesses. If there's an essential business that's not complying, what's our, do we have the, do you or the sheriff have the ability to close those? Do you want to clarify that? I mean, so... And I'm not trying to get into a whole bunch no, of what ifs and... I think, no, we're playing I, that out this morning. Yeah, I, I think <laughs> what this should say is that what we're looking for, the clearer it is, the more black and white, the less, the remove the ambiguities. And so it should say that the administrator would have the authority to close essential businesses that are not in compliance with the distancing requirements. Because, and remember, is that this is why I'm asking for this, because, you know, I got a thousand deputies out there, literally, we got a thousand of cops in Pinellas County. Everybody needs to try, and so here's what the governor's order says. And unfortunately, just the reality of it is there are some they're the ones that causes the problem. They're the few, they're not the majority, but they play games with us. And so where it says here in the governor's order, all persons in Florida, and I'm reading paragraph B of section one of the governor's order, all persons in Florida shall limit their movements and personal interactions. Well, it would be better if they said, you shall not do, but right. it says limit. They're gonna say, well, you know, it's limited. That means I can do it, but I can only do it to a certain, I mean, you're gonna get this, this is what we get. Okay. Just like you get these people that are hopping fences and, you know, they're playing games and all this other stuff. So make it easy for us is that you can't leave your house unless you're engaged in an essential activity or you're going to an essential business. And if you give us that all the essential businesses also have to shut their doors, that makes it really easy for us so because we don't have to play any games. Well, yeah. yeah. Well, actually, I, and I was just talking to Joe in the background. The the idea was you have a non-essential business, but we're gonna we're, they got to close anyway. Yeah, okay. But you have essential business that aren't to the maximum extent possible adhering to social distancing guidelines. So we just want to strike non-essential. Say close a business that's not adhering mm -hmm. to the compliance of this order. That makes it. It, it, so it could be an essential business not adhering to social distancing guidelines or a non a business for whatever reason decides they want to stay open, which we have that ability anyway. What we're really trying to highlight is folks take this seriously, and if not, we'll take additional measures necessary to ensure compliance. Okay. So you don't want to leave it as essential businesses instead of we just want to striking strike, non-essential? Just strike non-essential, so a business, period, because okay. you, you, then you're covered under either category. All right. Um, so, so the actions today are one, to extend the order for an additional seven days and all previously orders issued, pools, okay, playgrounds, all, the, all those types of things, and take these three additional um, steps to, to say that um, to refine essential business um, and, and any non-essential business is, has to close and then in turn um, talk about the social distancing guidelines for an essential business. Um, we think that, again, that'll help. The efforts that the sheriff took regarding enforcement um, will have to continue, obviously. Um, you know, last, last night, as I saw us kind of going here, I went back and I really looked to articles around the country. Obviously, every, every state's, you know, governing this. You've got several states that took strong actions a few weeks ago. Now they've got the sustainability of the order. And, you know, I think the sheriff use, has used the term squeezing a balloon, right? Well, that's, that's what they're seeing. It's going to require constant enforcement because people are cooped up. And, and then that, that leads them to make bad decisions. 
Um, so it'll require consummate enforcement. And I think the TIPS line is a great way of handling that. Uh, where we have an issue, we'll address it. Um, and, but then, you know, if we have to take additional measures, we can certainly do that. Uh, but we'll watch our compliance and let our data help us inform those decisions. So this extends all the things we've done before plus? The, the resolution, that the original resolution extends it and carries everything you did forward. <clears throat> This extra, the, the next resolution will do the items that we just talked about. Oh, oh okay. Uh, Correct, Mr. Peters. It's two separate um, orders, right? That's okay. I, I found the answer already. Uh, Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, um, and just to be clear, the, the essential, what's essential or not essential is from the governor's order. The governor's right. order, yeah. I mean, I know it refers to CDC and Miami Dade and that's correct. Ten other things, but that's what defines what an essential business is in Florida right now. That is correct. Because, and and again, I'm not looking to you know, if we're making the decisions, we're making the decision. That's fine. But half, if not more, of the communication that we get, in fact, texts and emails coming in during the meeting are, "Am I still essential? Or will I be yep. essential? Can you make me essential?" You know, and so it's just easier if we have that uniform. And to where we can say this is the governor's order it's not our decision mm -hmm. so that we don't spend our time doing that we've got enough other things to spend our time on and the sheriff the sheriff took a crack you know his staff took a crack at defining um what is meant because it, it draws from the department of homeland security and it draws from uh three different orders from miami dade um and so they he took a crack at kind of doing that we're going to put together a group uh immediately following this meeting that will try to boil it's, this down Almost um, easier if we say here are the first ten things that well, have to. That's what we're going to do. But, but one of the things I want you know again using this form because a lot of people watch it and for you all as you're getting these some of these people aren't going to agree with. And I'm telling you, you they're know, not going to agree with. Like there one of the know. things, and I, and I <laughs> my email, text message, phone calls have been blowing up over this is is that golf courses are staying open. Golf courses don't close under this. One of the ones that we're wrestling with. I mean, I'm wrestling is pawn shops. Yeah. And so at first blush, you could say they should close, but they do loans. And financial institutions can stay open in the secondhand dealers because they're loans. We're going to come up with a, a list, but of what we know, like things that absolutely have to close, just some quick examples, is beauty supply, bookstores, car washes, all clothing stores, consignment shops, uh, lighting stores, uh, florists, uh, jewelers. Uh, museums, paint, you know, you can go on and on with this, that, and this is what we're going to do. We're going to come up with a list and we're going to publicize it of what we know has to close. Mm -hmm. And then here's the, the bigger, thicker list of what is essential. And we're going to do the best we can to provide guidance to people, but everybody needs to know that we're going to do that due diligence do the best we can. There are some that are gray that we're going to have to make a call on, and there's some that people aren't going to agree with. But we don't have the option. We don't have the option, and you don't have the option of deeming something essential. The most you could do is to deem something that, that is essential. You could deem it non-essential and take it off because that's more restrictive. But you can't, we can't alter that. And I'm getting that too. I'm getting phone calls from people. All, they, want me, they want me to grant exceptions to your order to open their pools and allow an exception for it. I can't do that. So, and you didn't create any exceptions. So this is why it's, we can take this one moment to try and educate people on what it is in the process. It will help us all out. Can we make sure that we post them clearly somewhere so we can just refer we people? Will. And yeah. I think it's also uh, incumbent on every elected official at every level, not to, you know, not to, and, and I probably, you felt like I'm doing that some of this morning, but not to point at each other. And once we did our order, some of our cities weren't uh, happy with some of the orders that we did and, and weren't as, uh, collaborative and cooperative in their public statements and I don't want us to get into the governor this or the governor that but um, it is much clearer when it's coming from yeah right right mm -hmm. I agree. thank you um, really appreciate Commissioner Justice's comments um, and I think it helps to clarify we're working from the baseline or the Bible that the governor has put out there and and that's compiled from Homeland Security and Miami Dade, but that's what we're referring to. Um, my question: I want to be clear on the number of people, and the sheriff mentioned this. So, it, it, you've got the issue of more than ten people. So, in Publix, if there are twenty people in there, but they're not grouped together, that's okay. still allowable. Yes. Mm -hmm. Likewise with churches. Yes. If there are twenty people at a church, but they're not bunched together, that's still allowable. 
and, and I would say, I would say this, Commissioner, this is how I'm going to apply it. Okay, because uh, this is how I'm going to apply it because I think it's with uh, within the framework and, and the uh, spirit and the intent. So if it's in a church and you've got uh, a mom, a dad, and three kids, and they're in one pew and they're there in the five of them, then six feet apart, you've got a mom and a dad and three kids. That's fine. If you've got the pew and it is all full, and, it, it, and if it was one family and they had 15 people, then that's not allowed. So you've got to stay in groups of less than 10 if it's one family unit. And if they are spread out six feet apart, then you can have 200 people in that church as long as they are complying with those requirements that you have no more than 10 and that they be spread out apart and nobody you got to apply common sense to this. Absolutely. Nobody's suggesting that if you're taking grandma to church that and you got to hold her by the elbow, that you got to stay she, six feet apart from her. So, I mean, this is well, where some common sense is going to take us a long grandma way. grandma probably shouldn't be at church. Well, well, well that's true, because she can't go to church. But anyway, bad <laughs> no, example. But you get what I'm saying. It's, it's common sense, yeah, but yeah. what we've hear, yeah. been hearing as well, if there can't be more than 10 people in church in total. That's not true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that's one make, I want to make yeah. sure we yeah. clarify that. It, there's nothing in here that says that, and there's nothing in here and that the we governor's just, order doesn't speak to it. It does not. Okay. So, sure, Eggers. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I just had a couple questions because I'm just, again, we're trying to leave this meeting, and I know we're not going to completely uh, get what we want done, but <laughs> from from a clarity and consistency standpoint, you know, there's probably going to be a lot of follow up afterwards when folks call in to get questions answered. Um, I don't know who they're going to be talking to, you know. They're not going to be talking to that group that meets every meeting at 8 o'clock in the morning that has some real policy decision-making abilities because people have called me as we've been sitting here about contractors that do interior work, termite testing, massages as it relates to uh, uh, um, therapy work, that doctor-related, doctor-given, uh, call centers, pools. I still have a pro I still want to get back to this pool thing, but the pawn shops that you mentioned, and churches. Obviously, the churches is a big deal. Um, so can I answer all those? Yeah, okay. yeah. The only one that is a, uh, is a question mark in that whole list that you just read off is the call center, and I would say that it depends on the type of work that the call center Correct. is doing. Or the so you have to go to the type of service. because you need, right. that, That's under the DHS list, mm -hmm. primarily, and that's a, a workforce list, and it's very comprehensive. <laughs> Everything else that you just mentioned in there, so if it's a, a massage chiropractic and it's a therapy massage, then that's permitted. Uh, but if it's a general uh, massage, Sorry. then no. And, and, and okay, and let's, get, you know, I mean, we're not going to be get, getting there, I don't think. But that means that, so as an example, the massage business, Massage Envy, they're closed. And they're closed under the governor's order that shut down the massage. Comments. <clears throat> um, already yesterday I heard that people are applying for the payroll stimulus that may not really need it, and that money could run out. So I'm hoping that people use common sense again. And um, so my next uh, question is alarms at business and looting. Are we concerned about that? I mean, we got plenty of personnel as far as, I mean, out there, um, and we'll continue with the patrols, and of course we're responding to alarms and, and addressing it, and we'll continue to make the efforts to protect the businesses, um, and those businesses that are closed, and we'll make sure that we're keeping an eye on them, uh, where the people aren't there. Yeah, so. And should we ask the businesses to, you know, post an emergency number or some kind of way of getting in contact with them? We've got, all, we've got that, and, and remember, because, it, it I mean, they are closed at night, and and we do get the alarms and we have the contacts and we have a business watch program where businesses can register so that we have up-to-date information. All that infrastructure really is in place for that. I don't think there's anything more than we need to do. Uh, but we're, where we really need to keep an extra eye on them is during the daytime you know, because now is when they were ordinarily open and now they're going to be closed. And unfortunately, you know, there's those among us that take advantage and exploit and want to do some things they shouldn't be doing. But, but we've got plenty of people out there and, and we'll keep an eye on our businesses. Have we seen any price gouging? Yeah, N95 masks. They're, I think about 10 bucks a piece or something, but uh, that's ridiculous. But um, And most of them are the, the knockoffs that you can't get. But anyhow, as far as anything else is concerned, though, um, I, I haven't seen anything. We haven't had any complaints on it. Um, no issues that I'm aware of. And my final question for this point is 911. Is everything operating smoothly there? Yeah. yeah. 
They're they're open. Yeah, they're they're still continuing to operate. Um, very few employee callouts um, you know, in comparison. So, but you know, again, just as the sheriff's office and everybody out at the public safety center, um, when you come in, you're getting tested. Um, you, you know, been screened by a nurse, and so we're doing that to make sure the entire center is safe. Okay. Thank you. I'm very grateful. Sure, yeah. Um, I'm sorry, uh, Sheriff, just if you don't mind, and, and Barry and, and Dr. Cho, just a couple of questions. Um, it looks like, and as I was sitting here looking and scrounging through this Miami-Dade uh, amendment, they have several amendments also that are, are wrapped into this. Uh -huh. And in those amendments, it does allow marinas to be open. So I was trying to make sure that there wasn't an action that they had taken that was part of this that was restricting us. No. But it does say that it could from time to time be amended. Correct. So if they take local action on their marinas, which they have to close, it's not appearing in any of these amendments. No, so it, I mean, so we'll make sure I. No, no. So Commissioner, what's important yeah. is I believe, and we wrestled with this, and I think we kind of came to collective clarity with it, is that the only thing that you should read those Miami Dade orders for is the one section only that deals with the definition of essential businesses. The other things that are in those orders are inapplicable here. The only thing the governor incorporated in his order was the definition of essential businesses. So as an example, in the Miami-Dade order, it says, that as an example, that religious institutions, churches in Miami-Dade County, that it specifically says they do not have to comply with the social distancing requirements. There are, so anything else that's other than the, in the one section in those orders right. that is definitional, definitional is not applicable. But so, the amendments that do, do, do go back to that, that section are applicable. As far as definitions yeah, are concerned. Yeah. So when they added in one of them, I think they added in, uh, I want to say they added in like automobile repair shops or something right. to be added in. So anything that's definitional as to what is essential in the subsequent orders, but anything that is substantive that's unique to Miami-Dade County, all the other uh, numbered Understand. sections, they don't right. apply. Understand, but like, yeah. for instance, in one of these amendments, they did add gun shops. As yes. A, that right. wasn't in the original. It's essential. Yeah, right. That wasn't in the original Correct. essential list. But Correct. Correct. So Correct. they added. The question, I think, is if they, if they add another definition tomorrow, we're at a, we're at a time certain today yeah, of what Miami uh, Dade's list I think, is. I, I think it's a time. I, I would bet it's a time certain because that's from the governor's well, order. Does it say it, that? You have to go to the governor's order to see whether it says as amended. If it doesn't say as amended, then no, 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 that's a good question. Yeah. I would ask. Well, I'll have legal. Look so if at they that. don't, if they change something tomorrow, we're not always playing. It, it is as of today, kind of thing. Well, I'm legal. Will look at that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. And then the, just the final question gets back to the pools again. And I'm not, I'm not saying anybody else is interested in this, but I just wondered if pools and chlorine as it relates to, you know, people being in a pool together. Oh, and so I don't know the answer in terms of the water transmissibility and the effect of chlorine, but, but the concept uh, of the social distancing is, is preventing the, the gathering, obviously, because uh, this is a respiratory bug. Right. Um, so it is transmitted uh, via droplets, so, so preventing the people from there. That's the primary mode of spread. Uh, other ways that it could be spread is via um, inf uh, coughing and the, an infected person coughing and then touching a surface and then right. the next person touching it. So that's a, another way it could be spread. But I think the concept of in the pools isn't the safety of the water in itself. It's just congregating in a certain area. So the water issue is, is what's raising the question at this point. If they came out tomorrow and found that chlorine's a great killer of this stuff, I'm not saying it is, right, right. that might change. Well, I because, I mean, we're doing all these things that are social distancing, whether it's in a church, whether it's in a park, whether it's uh, in, the, in the boats out, out on the water. Mm -hmm. They all have their, their distancing thing. So I was just, just trying to hone in on why the pools themselves. And we did that. I'm not saying any, I'm not. I'm just asking why would we separate that out, uh, p private pools, um, differently than any, any other recreational opportunity we have. And I was wondering, from a health standpoint, if there was any basis for it. So not, not necessarily. It's it's just another avenue in which people can congregate. I think that's okay. It. Thank you. And clarification to the question: They believe it, that it's static, and unless the state or right. the federal issues additional clarifications regarding essential. So whatever's in place now. Correct. Yeah, it's a reference, not a conditional. That's what it looks like. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. My legal interpretation. Okay. <laughs> Do you have more or are we? No. I do have a couple of people that want to speak. Yeah. Um, no, I, I think, um, you know, just in conclusion, we believe that uh, the, the 
the, re the two resolutions would extend everything we've previously done and then add uh, the three items that we just um, discussed as an additional uh, measure. We will continue to monitor and enforce. You've delegated an authority uh, to me to take additional actions if, in fact, it's necessary. And as you know, we have our policy team that talks about our activities daily. Um, and so where we need to act, we will. Um, but, you know, we're, we think we're um, in a spot where, you know, largely we're seeing compliance and hope, hopefully that flattens the curve and protects our citizens. Yeah, and could we just, while, while we're getting these folks in, could we just double check that any of those amendments, one, two, or three of the day that are currently in place that we have to follow, do not close the marinas? I, I, I haven't found anything in here that says that marinas are closed and therefore we must close them. And we we haven't, we okay. haven't seen because that. I'm getting somebody that says uh, 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 order number amendment two says that that's the case and I'm not seeing that that's the case either. so I just want to make sure that you know that there's some people saying oh yeah it does uh, say that yeah, it must yeah, and be I've, I've got the same questions okay. <laughs> Kelly and them are out with cities and cities are saying that that was an amendment in governor's order we haven't seen that um, I haven't seen it anywhere I just want to make sure for our residents who are like wanting to make you know go ahead. Miami Dade order and this is of the 34 page governor's order, this is page 33. It specifically sta states that essential retail and commercial businesses which may re remain open includes marinas, boat launches, docking, fueling, marine supply, and other marina services. Yeah, that's the, uh, the it, uh, order 90 or 89 or whatever it was. Um, but it, and then the future amendments that we are also subject mm -hmm. to, I think they say that they must stay open or they are open. Well, the, you, what I just read from you is yeah. from the Miami-Dade order, which right. I think pursuant to the language right. of the governor's order is a static list, as we just said, that won't change. The state can change the list of essential services and the federal, the federal list can Do change. Do the amendments, are the amendments, uh, those first three amendments that are included here, are they included as part of that static list if yes. there's yes. any changes? Yes. Okay. And, yes. and specifically under the Miami-Dade order, um, it says essential retail and commercial, which may remain open, it, that includes um, private and municipal marinas, boat launches, docking, fueling, marine right. supply. That's in the original order, and that, it's also it's being in repeated Dade. in the, in the, in the amendments, order. correct? Correct. We're talking about the Miami-Dade The Miami-Dade amendments, Dade order, yes. Not the order, the amendments to the order. There's I haven't no, seen anything in that that says it, but they must be closed, right? I agree. No, okay. They're, they're allowed to remain open. Okay, that's. Correct. I just want to make sure what that was the case. What I just read from was the second, or was amendment yeah. number one. Yeah, I didn't see it either. I've just had some folks emailing saying, "Yeah, that's the case," and I, and I, I didn't I mean, see they, it. They've been pretty thorough in covering it because they actually address it. I think Barry was reading from one amendment, and I was reading from another. They've addressed it twice. One time they added it and said private municipal marinas and boat launches, docking, fueling, marine supply, and other marina services, and then they clarified that further and stated marinas, boat launches, docking. I, I, for some reason, they must have thought there needed to be an amendment, but they've actually twice said that those facilities are essential and therefore can remain open. We'll, we'll read this, I'm, but I'm going to the third order. The third order, it even repeats it as it may remain open. And it says marinas, boat launches, et cetera, and stuff. It, but it says only as set forth in emergency order uh, 06-20. So again, I'll, I'll have, you know, uh, the county attorney's office look and just make sure yeah, let's, I mean, that that is huge, obviously. No, I so, understand. I mean, we're assuming right now up here that we're, we're, unless we take action to change that, that we're keeping marinas open. And, and again, if the governor's order changes that, well, that changes it. So it's, I'm not worried about the governor's order. Well, this is, but the Miami Dade order would, would be that. And so if, if we have a different interpretation, it doesn't require an action of this board, it, that, would, that would close it. You know, if, if, if the Miami-Dade order is interpreted differently. But I do think that when we leave this meeting, that would be a really important point of clarification. So let's try to, we have other parts of the. I think we've clarified. I don't know how much more we, we, we can think we're clarify. clarified, but he, you're asking us to look at it again. We're looking at it okay. again. Okay. All right. I don't want any questions about it, so. Mm -hmm. He's going to get questions anyway, so. Okay. Well, we have a couple of people that would like to speak. First one is Tom Rask. Again, we'll remind, um, is it just the one? There's a couple here.
again reminding those who are going to come and speak that you'll have three minutes and there'll be a clock that shows your time. Good morning. Hello. Tom Ross. Good morning. I'm in Corporate Pinellas County. So I want to speak on the emergency order now and then separately on this new re proposed resolution. Um, when you first passed your emergency order, you did not take public comment. No public comment was called for. When you renewed it two weeks ago, you didn't do it. And also last week, the video record shows that. And I'm disappointed in the chair, but I'm actually disappointed in all of you because you've been doing this a long time. Your first instinct should be to call on the public for public comment. Because as you know, Florida Statute 286.0114 subsection 2 gives citizens the right to be heard. It's a statutory right. It's not by that you deign to give us that the opportunity to speak. So today I get to speak and I want to talk about your extension of the emergency order. Of course, the safer at home order and any other orders that you issue are pursuant to your, your uh, local state of emergency, your LOC order. And there's been a lot of discussion here about um, what permissive, restrictive, more or less restrictive. One thing that's clear is you cannot shut down gun shops. We have Second Amendment rights. The sheriff referenced um, certain DHS guidelines, March 28th, version 2, that define workforce. And under those guidelines, uh, anything related to the sale, manufacture, distribution of firearms is considered an essential function. Now, there's also been a lot of talk about um, what you're doing. The first question you should ask, is it working? Um, I'm not sure it is. And uh, as the chair re-enters the room, I want to say I want to speak on both the emergency order and on the separate, because it's going to be two separate votes. And while you were out, I cited, I can either just keep going, I think I can finish this up in two more minutes. Uh, I'd like to ask audiovisual to uh, focus on this document here rather than me, so I can show. And there's some things I want to show you. The first question you should ask, are your efforts working? Okay, here are the daily deaths in Italy compared to the US. And what you see is that it's a little bit hard to see. The reason I've lined them up this way is to line up March 2nd with March 10th. And you'll see that Italy hit 250 deaths a day uh, March 13th, and the U.S. hit that number uh, about March 25th or 26th, let's say two weeks. We're two weeks behind Italy, okay? Italy, as you will see, it's not working. They're not containing it. They're not mitigating it. There was a Wall Street Journal article yesterday and Madam Chair, if you'll just let me continue. Okay, thank you. Um, that showed that for the last five years, the average number of deaths has been about 1,000 in the province of Bergamo, Italy, which is 1.1 million residents, which is about the same as here. This year, it was 5,400. Don't get hung up on that it says estimate here because they have a different chart showing for the city of Bergamo, as it's pronounced. Um, and th these numbers are hard numbers, they're accurate. And they show that the coronavirus deaths were, that were reported were about 2,000, but the excess mortality was actually 4,500. That's the reality. Okay. This is a picture from FDR and, and 30th Street East in New York City yesterday. It shows five refrigerated trucks that have been rented by the city and placed there near Bellevue Hospital. Now what's in those trucks? <coughs> Bodies. And I'll go away from this slide quickly because it's unpleasant. If we go back to the numbers for Italy, and remember that we have about the same size county, I want to stress, it's not at all clear that your mitigation efforts are working. It's certainly clear that containment, it's not contained in the U.S. We had 1,000 deaths yesterday in the U.S., okay? By tax day, that number could be 10,000 per day. I'll talk more about that when you get to your transportation update. So what I'm wondering is, instead of talking about 
can this condo pool be open? I got a text about it while I was down in the lobby uh, from someone you know. Whether this condo pool can be open, whether this or that can be open, do you have 5,000 body bags? Because if you want to prepare for worst case scenario, you should look at what the worst case scenario is. So I want to stress that um, it's not at all clear to me when you look at the charts, whether it's from CDC, New York Times, whatever you look at, it's not at all clear that your containment efforts are working. I understand that you have to do them, because if you don't do them, uh, they'll be held to pay. But please keep in mind that neither containment or mitigation is working right now. I want to uh, thank everybody for their efforts. I wanted to make a couple other quick comments, though. Um, the comment was made about Publix. Please be aware your order only applies to the business's workforce. They are not required to police vendors or customers. It applies to workforce only. And then as far as what, what constitutes a senior citizen, that was brought up in, in, before. Well, I guess that would be whoever identifies as a senior citizen. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Chris Verkulin. Bit of a lag out there. I apologize for the tardiness. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, good afternoon. Um, so, from my comments last week, we still need to know as citizens what disease metrics we're using to determine the need for this order and what metrics we're going to use to lift this order. I would like it to be written into the order proceeding or going forward. That would be <clears throat> much appreciated for the citizens to have some transparency, know we have a plan to execute this thing properly. Uh, if your goal is zero cases and zero spread, <laughs> that's unreasonable and it's unattainable. I need you to reevaluate re your goals if that's what you're trying to go for. We can't lock down life to that point. We need to have some reasonable effort here, as uh, Mr. Welch said regarding the, the salons. We have businesses that are complying, that are doing their very best to operate, and they're, 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 not, they're not allowing spread to happen. But we're still going to close those businesses. We'd rather have people go on unemployment and have that, that money taken away from our futures as citizens, then have them operate safely. We need to reevaluate that as one of our priorities. You know, Continue to operate within the parameters that we have given, not close them down arbitrarily because we think that they're not doing things safely. Um, I, I just watched a slideshow that Sheriff Bob put on here, and he was explaining to all of you that 99% of people are conducting business, recreating, and uh, everything else properly, but we're still looking to con continue restricting movement and restrict activities even more. That, that, that shouldn't be the case. We need to operate as normally as possible <clears throat> while containing the disease the best we can, okay? Uh, I can use the same gas pump, touch the same produce at the grocery, and touch the same box of screws at Home Depot that a COVID patient can touch, but I can't go get my hair cut, okay? I can't go buy, uh, you know, I, I run a watch business, I can't, I can't service a watch, I can't uh, sell anything to my clients, but those things can take place and we still have spread occurring from those things and we're still gonna see the numbers increase because of those activities, the essential activities like pumping gas, touching produce, and, and we're gonna have these, these, measure, these cases increasing because of those things, but we have people that are acting safely that are being restricted because, you know, these cases are climbing whether we're, we're doing it or not, you know? Um, and I'm calling the board to leave our order as is, or at the very least, keep the order as minimally restrictive as possible within the state guidelines. Um, so I live on Gandy Beach. I live really close to Gandy Beach. I'm off for the next month. I'm working at home somewhat. I'm confined to my bedroom or living room. I can sit on my couch and I can lay in my bed. That's pretty much all I can do under this order or as you propose things in the future. Um, I saw Sheriff Bob being interviewed on Wednesday saying that we're not going to close Gandy Beach because people are 
we're going to say people they're doing things wrong, but we're going to keep it open. Two days later, I go to Gandhi Beach. I'm running by it to get some exercise in. It's closed. I have nowhere to go. I have nothing to do other than sit in my bedroom and sit in my house for the next 30 days. I don't see why we can't have certain public places open. And if Sheriff Bob's people can cite them, if they're people, if they're not acting properly, why we can't have these places open? Uh, that's really all I have. I really can, would urge you to, at the very minimum, strike the First Amendment off from the order. That's Thank you. absurd. And that's, that's exactly what we're talking about as far as this is what we're going to get for the next 30 days right. of people not understanding it's the governor's order, not ours. Exactly. Okay. Is that all the public comment? Um, so you have two uh, resolutions before you. Um, these, uh, the two orders would both extend. Actually, I've only got one here. Two. One that was uh, the one, the original one with the, with the resolution or with the um, agenda. And yeah. there's nothing in there. Yeah, the only thing we have. There were, it was, updated. Yeah, it should have been well, it was updated. Okay. It should have been attached. So that and that order would effectuate the um, extending, uh, extending the. Um, um, a, okay. the emergency for an additional seven days um, and then carry forward all the previous orders that you issued. Okay. Okay? okay. So that's the first action. The second action, which is what we discussed, um, would take the, the those three actions to um, close non-essential uh, businesses and t to the maximum extent possible require implementation of CDC guidelines to essential businesses. Move approval of the extension of the emergency order as. Okay. I just have a question. Um, so this one we're going to continue to have to vote on every week. Unless I know at some point you said that the, the administrator or there was some way for the administrator to do that. You could delegate that to either the administrator or to the chair uh, if you so chose to do that. Madam Chair, then I would amend my motion to grant the authority to the chair or administrator to extend the emergency order as long as there's no substantive changes to that emergency order. Okay. okay. Just on the off chance that we're not able to come back and meet. Quick right. Or if that would be the only thing we're going to meet for that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Just a quick note okay. uh, of clarification based on the last speaker. Recreation is is still allowed as long as you maintain the social distancing. So you still Correct. can go out, run, walk, whatever. Yeah. Yes. Just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, just uh, again on the on the hairdresser, and I think I think the sheriff kind of explained it to me because there seemed to be a provision in the in the agreement that says nothing in this order prohibits individuals from working from home. Indeed, this order encourages individuals to work from home. So I was thinking. This is. That's the second. Okay. Next next, the next thing item. we're going to take. Okay. Let me. I'll get to that. In the, in the this second. is the underlying basic order. Okay. Never mind. With the amendment. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. We, need, we don't need to vote on the amendment, do we? Sorry, Commissioner Steele. I just, um, because our email's been blowing up about the marina question from basically one individual, we'll I'm assuming because the governor's order only attached amendment number three to the orders that it's only the amendments that were attached to the governor's orders that we have to enforce. Uh, it's one, two, and three. There's three amendments. Right. There's th yeah, there are three amendments attached to the governor's order. But there's not the one that the gentleman's to referring at, to as of March 21st. We're going to need to take a look at all those. I okay. know Don's been pulling those, and there are some reference in there. The fact is we can't change it because it's the governor's order. All we Correct. can do is provide the information. So we're going to need to take a look at all those because there's another order, 0620, which is referenced in the Miami-Dade order, which may well be included. And all I can say is we can research. We can't, we can't change it because it's in the governor's order. And again, this is the next vote, not this one, right? Mm -hmm. That's Correct. Correct. So we'll talk about that in a second. Okay. So we have a motion from Commissioner Justice, second from Commissioner Peters. To approve as amended. To approve as amended. It, it, and I just want to make sure that is just to leaving the this first step that we're doing in place so that we can keep rolling that. Unless, it seems to me this is the only time we get a chance to talk. 
yeah. we listen to your meetings every day, and I just like, hey, you know, and you, we can't talk and interact. I'm so sure these are the only opportunities. Yeah, on there, there is. <laughs> um, you guys don't seem to care. You just keep going on. Like, no, I'm kidding. Um, but um, so this I'm is kidding. that's true. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. It drives me nuts. But anyway, um, it's probably good therapy in some ways. But uh, so so this is the only time we get a chance to talk. Sure, absolutely. And, um, and so anything that we change, which is uh, that we're going to talk about in the next issue, would have to come before us, and it wouldn't just right. So. Correct. Well, this would this yeah this yeah. delegates the, um, the emergency order, the emergency just order, the and any of the previously order. passed items. Okay. Thank okay. you. Thank Everybody you. clear on that? Mm -hmm. Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. Oh, they they put it up on our board. Oh, you did. <laughs> So I don't have access. I don't have to it. Mike. No. I'm a Thank yes. You. All of yours say aye. Yes. Aye. Aye, aye, aye. Are there any nays? I didn't think so. Okay. Next issue. The next item is the resolution, which would, again, um, say that any retail business operation or organization not included in the category is essential service, um, um, as, as defined by the governor's executive order, or may be amended, must close. Um, and then that to, for businesses operating under, the, under as essential businesses, that to the maximum extent possible must implement CDC social distancing guidelines. Okay. Well, approval. And that includes, I'll second it, that includes a change in item three yeah, for all businesses, not just non essential. Yes. They're not that, complying. You struck the word non-essential. Well, you, you, you struck the word non-essential. Okay. So whether people agree or not with us on any of these decisions, that some of them are out of our hands, the one thing that we're going to walk away from today, which is a huge question mark at this point, is whether or not the marinas are included in this order by the governor as it re relates to the three amendments in Dade County. That, That's what we're going to be investigating. That will be an that will be an interpretation issue. That is that that. We have to find out that doesn't change this order at all because that is whether the governor included that or not. Understood. We're not taking any action Correct. ourselves to close the marinas. Correct. But they may be closed. At, we just don't know at this point. Uh, we, we interpret it that they're open. Okay. Mm -hmm. So until someone proves that different, then we're interpreting it as a, they're open. Now, I will tell you, you're, you're going to get calls, probably those down south, because FDOT changed their message boards because Manatee closed their boat ramps. And so some of their message boards going over the Skyway Bridge, people are seeing that and saying that the boat ramps are closed. So there's, there's, some, there's some issues out there that are causing some confusion uh, beyond even the interpretation issue that we're dealing with. Okay. But as soon as we figure out whether there's anything modifying that particular Aspect. We, we will we'll send out an email. We won't modify what we do. It just interpretation, as you say, right. of what's in place. That's correct. And we'll, we'll if if there if there's something different than the way we've interpreted it, we will absolutely um, make a big deal out of that and push that out. Okay. So we have a motion from Commissioner Long, second from Commissioner Welch. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. Okay. okay. Well, um, okay, so the second item that... <laughs> well, do we want to... Um, yes, is this going to take a while, or do you think... Depends on how much discussion there is on the item. Um, <laughs> uh, not, not much. Um, yes, uh, we do want to take a break. Do well, I just for else? a few minutes, can we I, just break? Just make one comment. I had it on my list. Um, I had a call yesterday, and I would like to propose that um, our turnaround on paying our vendors as well as any not-for-profits or so on be expedited as much as possible because the flow of money is going to be very important. So sometimes we don't move things as rapidly and granted we want to make sure they're all legal invoices <laughs> and all of that but let's see if we can ramp that up. Good point. Okay. Well let's take a 30 minute break then because we still have agenda briefing after. We do. We have, um, so if, 
So we'll, we'll, we can take a break. We just want to talk about the, the, I do not have a presentation on the transportation. I just want to know where you want to go with that. Yeah. All right. Um, and and I, I, I've talked to each one of you, so okay. you guys can okay. discuss that. Um, then, you know, then the, the final item is the agenda brief. Um, the items one through six, okay, we heard you loud and clear from the beginning of our meeting. We didn't get off to a good start. I get that. Um, and so we have postponed. We went back to the person that was that had a contract and they were they did not want to postpone it. They've agreed to postpone it. Um, so they all the public hearings can be moved off into a future date. We'll re-advertise those and that will then allow for the meeting on next Tuesday to be um, online. Thank you. Okay, great. Great. Thank you. And those people will be able to do it from home. Well, we, we are canceling public the public. I know. I'm not talking about Tuesday. I'm talking about in the future. All public That's hearings. Correct, because we'll, then we'll advertise it as online, and then therefore they'll be able to make their case uh, for their particular item online also. Thank you. Okay. So you just be back here at 20 minutes to 1. 20 minutes to, to 1? Yep. Yes. Half an hour, as you're saying? Did. Okay. All right. Yep. Sure, yeah. If you want to make it smaller or shorter, whatever. Thank you.
meeting to order again. And we're going to talk about transportation. So, <clears throat> as you know, we were um, scheduled to come before you today to present options regarding a transportation referendum that would be held at the um, this fall. Um, and so we have options available to you. We've worked with the cities um, and we were in a position to present that to you. However, you know, things have changed. Times and so prior, changing. rather than having the discussion about those options, we first wanted to see what the pleasure of the commission is uh, regarding whether or not you're even willing to move forward with that. Now, your options ob obviously are it's not to move forward. Um, if you did move forward and you decided to place a referendum before the voters, you would have until August the 11th to remove that um, from um, from the ballot. So you you could put it on and then take at a time up until that time uh, the printing of the ballots to pull it off. So so really we're looking for just direction in terms of what the pleasure of the commission is at this point. And uh, following that, then we can take additional steps. Uh, Commissioner Long. <clears throat> Thank you, Barry. Um, I would just like to say at this moment in time that I think it would be really inappropriate to move forward with this issue at this moment. I'm really worried about making sure that we can provide essential services for our citizens come when we get done working with our budget for next year. And so for this moment in time, I think we might have a lot more serious issues that are going to come before us than this one, though I think we all recognize it's a really critical time uh, in our whole world right now. And with all that said, I don't know if you all had an opportunity to read the article that I had asked Doyle to send out to you yesterday. In particular, I found the last two sections of that article really thought-provoking, <clears throat> excuse me, about how we might be able to move forward and rethink mm -hmm. how we do business in a lot of areas that we work in, not just transportation and public transportation. So while I think that out of every great <coughs> adversity, there comes enormous opportunities, I'd rather that we focus our energy and our time working through where we think our budget is going to be. And we haven't heard from Bill in a long, long time. I'm assuming he's working on that. He is. So um, I'd rather hear from him before we take any movement on this issue. My opinion. Commissioner Eggers? Well, I mean, I, I, up until the last sentence, I, I couldn't agree more with you. Um, I don't need to hear from Bill um, on the issue as it relates to having this d discussion on a referendum. I think your comments about um, this is not the time or place to be talking about a tax increase uh, when we have other issues, other services that we're going to have to really rally the troops to make sure that we can provide to our residents. And um, so I, I, it's definitely not the time. And, and it, you know, so I don't really need to hear from anybody. I certainly would like to table any conversation that we have that leads to a decision to put any referendum language on a ballot, um, period. And, and that doesn't mean you can't have the discussion over the next six months and a year, two years, because in 2022, that opportunity will come again. Mm -hmm. And so I think those are certainly appropriate. In fact, I'd love to have more conversation about it come next year and, and than we've had in this previous year so more people can get on board with it. But clearly now is not the time. So I would just move that we table any of that discussion that leads to any referendum decision. Thank you. Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, what is our, our timeline as far as deadlines and things like that? For so we have to have a public hearing and, and adoption of the um, – ballot uh, to put that ba a resolution that would place that on the ballot no later than May the 7th. So um, there's a May 5th commission meeting, so you could do it there, you could do it at April 21st, um, and but again, we have to notice it, you know, et cetera and stuff, so. Yeah, it's, it's hard to believe that much is going to change in the, the worldview between now and those deadlines that you just mentioned, um, and even if it's the absolute right thing to do, which we even haven't had that conversation yet. It's hard to see it gaining much public favor 
at this point. I mean, it's just. Right. Mr. Welch. I, I would uh, agree <coughs> for uh, slightly different reasons. Um, you know, I think it's a capacity issue and, and the capacity of our constituents to even really comprehend or even think about this when the peak is not even here yet. The peak is not even here till May. Uh -huh. And we just talked today about businesses that will be shutting down at 1201. Yep. Our community is not going to be able to even comprehend or even think about this. They're thinking about putting food on the table. You know, kids aren't even going back to school. So I, I, I agree for those reasons. I also, the capacity of our staff, they're working 24-7 just trying to keep people safe. So like Commissioner Long, I'd rather have you focus on that. Um, and the other issue is, is collaboration. I think we have a much better <sighs> presentation when we are talking about this the same time that Hillsborough is and Hillsborough by their action will not be considering this this year so for all those reasons I agree this is not uh, the right time and I wouldn't support moving forward Commissioner Sue sure. oops sorry <laughs> I need to step on you there and I agree as well um, I I just have to bring back one little piece of history when we wanted to put do the um, referendum in 2014 I was I did not want to put it on the ballot because we were coming out of the Great Recession at that point and I was very concerned about the timing um, now with what we're encountering is a hundred times worse a thousand times worse I think asking our citizens who are as Commissioner Welch said dealing with survival at this point and dealing with you know just putting food on their table and living their lives I also, you know, you can see already by the lack of cars on the street what a change that's making. And Commissioner Long, that was a very insightful article. If we were going to do anything, it might be to look at some of those other yeah. options <clears throat> and seeing if we can convert some of our streets currently without much expense. Um, so um, I applaud this commission for being cognizant of the needs of our citizens and being aware of them so thank you well i would agree i would just hope that somebody on the staff will be looking out for those infrastructure uh the infrastructure funds that are supposed mm -hmm. to be coming down because yep. there was quite a chunk of money in the transportation category so mm -hmm. who knows what we might be able to accomplish out of adversity Okay. So, oh, we do have one person that would like to comment. Of course. I'm Rask. <coughs> He's going to tell us we shouldn't do it. Let's start the clock now. <laughs> We're waiting. <clears throat> Barry, when will we start to talk about budget impacts and issues? And Well, we're already starting to talk about budget impacts. Um, unfortunately, from state sales tax, are about a two-month delay in the reporting from the state. Um, but, you know, we're obviously looking at numbers from previous years as a guide, um, you know, and making some assumptions based upon that. Um, it, uh, it's really going to determine how long, you know, this lasts. Um, so we're going to come in with a uh, financial plan and we're going to come in with alternatives um, and that way we uh, can then because by the time we're talking about this we still may not know the full impact and so we'll come in with options and alternatives um, and based upon that and, and, and approach it that way. We are, we are looking at that already um, but I mentioned it real briefly but I, wanna, I just want to highlight it. We're really breaking down the stimulus dollars um, because there's monies that we can get to our residents um, and we're figuring out how we can do that sooner than later mm -hmm. um, and 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 I, I, but I want to have programmatic ways of approaching it and so we've got Lourdes and her team are reaching out to others and they're pulling together a group uh, to do that including with businesses and others um, and so again trying to break down that some of the <coughs> stimulus dollars it's a potential significant amount of money and mm -hmm. I'd rather get it where where the need is where that greatest need is um, but again, we want to do that soon. So they're already working on that. We'll be back to you very soon with some recommendations. Okay, thanks. 
Mr. Esk. Hello again, Tom Rask on Incorporated Pinellas County. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak, even though I understand this is not an item you're voting on. Uh, you may be aware of a European Union funded study from 2018 uh, from PANDHUB. It, yes, the PAN stands for pandemic. Um, it has about prevention and management of high threat pathogen incidents and transport hubs. And that study found that, quote, mass transportation systems offer an effective way of accelerating the spread of diseases within communities. So I support you not going forward with this, but I think that the uh, people listening at home and voters need to know um, what's really going on here. Uh, Commissioner Seal said she was opposed to putting this on the ballot, or Greenlight Pinellas on the ballot, um, six years ago, but the record reflects she voted for it. Oh, I did, but I, I asked for us to not do but you, Okay, I don't want to get into back and forth because that sets a bad precedent, but the, the, the record reflects you voted to put it on the ballot. And if you had voted today to go ahead with it, that would mean that every single one of you here is in favor of it. In fact, uh, not to uh, be on Commissioner Seal's case so much, I consider her a friend, but at the Tibarta meeting here in February, she talked about having some kind of event. She was discussing with Commissioner Long, and she mentioned having like a touch a truck. She used the term touch a truck, where people could touch the things. Well, right now, they don't want to touch a truck, they don't want to touch a bus, they don't want to touch a train, and they also don't want you to touch their wallet. As Chairman uh, Miller said in Hillsborough yesterday, April 1st, rent was due, mortgage is due, car payments are due, and people don't have jobs, okay? Furthermore, what I was indicating before when I spoke here earlier, and maybe I didn't do it clearly enough, I wish that mitigation was working. I wish that containment was working. But the evidence shows it's not. And I think that's what Chairman Miller over in Hillsborough was referring to yesterday when he said it's going to get worse. So if you had gone ahead with this public hearing, you might have been doing it at a time when dozens, if not over 100, are dying per day here in Pinellas County. And that does not give citizens an opportunity to be heard or ponder the issue or anything else. Th this is serious. Um, we're going to have, um, I hope I'm wrong, but we're going to have problems. So I want to repeat my question before, and I want to <laughs> phrase it as a public records request, both to the county administrator and Dr. Cho, if he's still here. It really depends on whose responsibility it is. But how many body bags do you have? Because that's part of preparedness. You prepare for the worst case and you hope it doesn't happen. And I hope the data I gave you before from Bergamo, Italy was clear. Um, very briefly, I understand that one commissioner couldn't go to the grocery store because of a certain vote on a water tower. If you had voted to put this on the ballot or even go ahead with this, none of you could have been able to go to the grocery store for a long time. You could have been on permanent stay at home. Thank you. Thank you. As you know, we're not going to put it on the ballot. Um, Mr. Rask, you also signed up to be heard under Citizens to be Heard. Yes. And that is next on the agenda, if you'd Thank like you. to just do that. Again, Tom Rask, Unincorporated Pinell Count, Pinellas <coughs> County. Um, there are a lot of articles uh, on TampaBayGuardian.com, a site which makes no revenue which uh, uh, I write most of the articles on, but not all. I want to disclose that to anyone listening. And what we've been covering is government gone wild in this uh, pandemic. Not just this agency, but uh, the mayor of St. Pete, the governor, FWC, etc. It's important that in order for you to preserve people's respect for the law, it's important that you do things lawfully. Uh, you may already have it. I don't have a pool. I don't have a condo pool. Um, but you may already have an insur insurrection on your hands with respect to that. As I said here when I was here a week ago, when I was here a week ago, I said, uh, don't put the sheriff in, in the position of enforcing laws, local laws, that the people don't want enforced. So I want you to consider that. I also question whether you can delegate the authority to the chair or the administrator to extend the LSC, the local state of emergency, simply by motion. I raise that question. It is a question. Can you do it that way or does it have to be by resolution? What does the statute say? 
and maybe the county attorney's office will, will have an answer for me. Uh, I also want to stress what I touched on briefly before because there was a lot of talk about uh, restrictive or less restrictive, more restrictive, uh, that under the governor's order, uh, the, the law, law enforcement, particularly the sheriffs, cannot be shutting down um, gun shops. Anything to do with the Second Amendment, stay away from that because the governor incorporated those DHS guidelines by reference uh, in his order. Okay, so I also wanted to touch briefly on, no pun intended, on Tampa Bay Guardian. We regrettably ran an article a week ago about the, what we called, covidiot touch fest that occurred here a week ago. A covidiot is someone who doesn't understand the seriousness of COVID-19. Now I'm glad to hear that uh, to see that staff here are now keeping their distance. However, I observed the chair going into the elevator, walking down the hall. First of all, I observed the chair walking side by side, and I have a picture of it, closer than six feet. Now, you're exempt because you're government, but it doesn't set a good example. For the, you're imposing this on other people. You're saying, by force of law, you have to follow <coughs> CDC's social distancing guidelines. Then you don't do it yourself. I was told that I could not go up in the same elevator as another citizen. We had to take separate elevators. But Commissioner Welch went up with somebody else. Now, that's not his fault, but please be cognizant of these things. Please be cognizant of how it looks. Thank you. Thank you. That was my husband, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> same um, family then, right? Yeah, same family. Um, OK, next issue. Agenda briefing. The last item is the agenda review for next Tuesday's uh, online meeting. So items um, one through six, um, well, actually item number four. So we had a clarification. So this uh, does have a, um, a public hearing and it's been, and because of the notice issues, we cannot hold that public hearing. Mm -hmm. However, staffs, there's two pieces to this, both the public hearing and the execution of an interlocal agreement. Um, so with the Hillsborough County Industrial uh, Development um, Authority, what we could do is approve the interlocal agreement and authorize a hearing officer uh, through Baycare to conduct the public hearing. Uh, so they've asked for that amendment and then that way they could move forward with the issuance of this. Um, so that one and all the rest of items one through six will be postponed to a future date. Okay. I've got a question on four. Um, it's really not that. I'm just curious why they went to the Hillsborough County yeah, that instead was a of us. Question I had. I had. Um, so Don will come up and answer that. Had that same question. Uh, good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, frankly, they could go to any one of several of them. I don't know. They started actually with the city of Tampa, uh, who declined to move forward with it. Uh, I think that was a capacity issue. Uh, they had a lot of turnover uh, at, at their legal and, and bond staff at that point, I think. Uh, Hillsborough was willing to move forward with it. Um, they're obviously a very sophisticated um, borrower with uh, very sophisticated bond counsel. Uh, our bond council has also been engaged with trying to help facilitate the process. Um, some options for this this public hearing that is, I mean, we're building this plane as we fly it at this point. Um, right now, what had been on your agenda was a public hearing for a TEFRA resolution and an interlocal agreement that, that allowed that power to be shared so that the Hillsborough IDA could issue within in, in Pinellas County. One option would be if, um, to, to move this along would be to take that off of your public hearing agenda and simply adopt the interlocal agreement um, as just a regular agenda item with the proviso that you all kind of at least um, uh, at this point, one of the options is they could have a hearing officer hold the public hearing elsewhere. And when it comes back to you, it's simply on your consent agenda. So you wouldn't even have to have the public hearing on that. That was what I was saying. So we'd modify it after this, but that I think answers your question. As long as, long as there's consensus, there's consensus that that would be okay with the board that a hearing officer hear it rather than coming to you. Frankly, I've never seen a TAFRA hearing have a public comment at one of right. your meetings. So <laughs> Me neither. 
Uh, Go for what you asked for. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so with that modification, we'll move that item to the regular agenda. Um, and then, so that, that dispenses up with items one through six. Um, items eight through 21 are um, report and files and miscellaneous uh, for filings. Um, item 22 is a resolution um, supplementing the general fund with unanticipated grant revenue and aligning appropriations. And they're listed there within the uh, bullets. Oh. oh, sorry. No, it's okay. I'm, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to get um, knee deep in all this, but we always throw the reports received for filing and we always include those inspector general reports. Um, I, I have not had a chance to take a look at them. Mm -hmm. Is there any, anything that jumps out at you in any of those cases that we need to be? <coughs> I mean, I don't see them in the same level as some of the other re uh, um, receive and file. This is kind of, these can be kind of, um, there can I, be some issues. I've, here I've, read, I've read each one of these. Um, you know, from my, my memory, everything that was recommended was implemented, so I, I don't remember anything that sticks out okay well so we'll just bring that up on Tuesday if there is so. yeah sure okay okay so that was Thank item you. 22 any questions on 22 yep. um, 23 is an award of a bid uh, for phase two sidewalks um, on Sherwood Street to Sunset Point <clears throat> item 24 is a joint funding agreement with US Geological Survey um, this will do our, um, let's see, data gathering. This gathers the data, data monitoring, including flood stage, discharge, rainfall. <coughs> Item 25 is an award of a bid for a pump station generator improvement project. 26 is a bid for a force main air release valve replacement at Highland Lake. 27 is an award of a bid for the annual portable water and reclaim water repair services. So miscellaneous services throughout our area. And on to the county attorney. And the county attorney, um, on your consent, you'll see four cases there. They are all negligence cases. There are two slip and falls and two auto accidents. Two auto accidents? Two auto accidents, yeah. Before there are two slip and falls, two auto accidents. Okay. Um, 32 is a map amendment submitted by the city of Clearwater. Into the regular agenda. Um, item 33 is declaring surplus. Um, so this is a little um, different, but this is a resolution to declare a vacant county-owned condominium unit within the town apartments as surplus and establishing a minimum bid to bid that out. That was received through um, a home investment partnership program funds. Mm. Yeah. That is interesting. Yeah, yeah. It's a little bit different. <laughs> as Charlie's condo, we, we didn't want to own a condo, but we do. So um, the Justice condo. <laughs> um, Thirty-four is a purchase authorization with Ring Corp Power Corporation to purchase a Caterpillar uh, big generator. Uh, I figured you'd ask me a technical question of what that means, so I didn't want to answer that. Um, Thirty-five is a change order number one. Uh, for McKay Creek Water Improvement Project. Um, this was due to unforeseen uh, uh, underground limestone and clay encountered during the construction. Um, 36 is a First Amendment with Cone Graham for the Design Bill Professional Services. This is for the North Pinellas Troop uh, Loop. <laughs> um, and so this establishes the maximum guaranteed price we're going to bring back to you. Um, actual design issues with that top portion at a later date. That was also going to be here in April. We're going to push that off to a later date because we know we'll have uh, public participation during that. So this just sets a maximum price. 37 is a change order contract. Um, this is for um, the wastewater treatment plant and water plant. Let's see. <coughs> to the wastewater treatment, repair, maintenance, and construction for underground utilities. Any 
questions? 38 is an amendment number seven to master services agreement with environmental systems research. This is for our GIS software. Thirty-nine is your local workforce uh, services plan with WorkNet, i.e., Career Source Pinellas. Question, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. Are y'all still uh, operating normally at Career Source, or no? I think they only have one out-facing office open to help people with. Um, I think. Well, I'm not sure with what, but you most think? of the sites of all but one site is closed. Okay. They're working from home. Thanks. 37's companion. This does the extension for the designation to provide the direct service. 41's county attorney. Under 41, we are looking for authority to file suit against Duke Energy. Um, this is a case that came out of a construction project. It was a project at Belcher and Bel Air. Um, staff gave notice to Duke to move their utilities, which is something that we do. It's a statutory process that we go through. Uh, they failed to timely do so, and these are the we would be suing for the delay damages that were um, suffered by the contractor. Mm -hmm. okay. Do they have a statutory time that they have to adhere to? I believe that they do, so I can find out for sure there is a statutory process for doing so, mm -hmm. um, and, and they just didn't. So I'll find, I'll find out the answer to that question for certain. Though. Next, you have three appointments. One, Citizens Advisory Committee for the <coughs> South St. Petersburg Community Redevelopment Area. Um, it's next, for the Lowman Community Redevelopment Area. And one for the Tourism Development Council. Question? Yes. So logistically, we're just going to do that verbally? Logistically, you'll, you'll do it verbally. Say yeah. again. Well, yeah, but you're still going to, you're, you're going to be able to see it, but they're still going to be just calling it out. You, know, you mean you mean for the vote? Oh, okay, come on up. You've been involved in that. Okay. Sorry. I'm going to be seeing Sorry. this the same way as you guys for Don the first Cole. time. Again, back to building the plane as we fly it. The clerk's office has put together a draft process that kind of gives you a couple of different options to email you out ballots that you will email back to the clerk mm. for those oh. kinds of issues. Uh, or okay. they may take verbal votes either one. It, it depends on on the complexity of, of the balloting, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is is the emailing the ballot out, is that in, in the Zoom program or is that? Nope. Be, it will come out via your regular email and, and it then, will be preserved as public record. It's not going to be. So then would we, how would we, if it's on our iPad, how would we? actually mark a vote or circle the candidate or BTS is going to be and OTI um, I believe are going to walk you through some okay. of the process here later I think they can help you with some of those technical things um, I believe you may have two devices you're dealing with one to run the meeting on and the other to operate kind of your 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 agenda and that kind of stuff right um, I expect that uh, one of those two devices will allow you to pull up an email. Um, but you're talking right, about emailing not, outside of the program. Yes. Yeah. It is not within the Zoom program. Right. But if it comes to us as a email attachment, for example, I'm assuming, and again, we, I don't need to get into we're going to do it, but if it, how do you mark that and then Mr. scan it? You can just email us back saying, I vote yes, I vote no. And, and of course, right. they have some name. type of record you that shows how you voted on each Yes, sir. And I, It'll I've be been a list of names, and you pick the name you want, email back okay. that name. And then on a side, though, the whole Zoom meeting is being recorded, correct? So It is. So, all right. But just like you pass paper ballots sure. down at this meeting, that will also be recorded. It will be public record. Um, and all of those issues have been. Okay. okay. Thank you. Then the last item is an MSTU fund proposal by Commissioner Justice. <clears throat> That concludes the agenda. A wood chipper. For the condo. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff in that condo. <laughs> Funny. Okay. Anything else? 
we need to talk about. Yeah, this one is very, you've been very calm, great rudder at the helm. <laughs> Thank you to you and to the entire staff. All the staff. Being on those EOC calls um, just brings Absolutely. really all we're, we're frightened. You all are very calm and very deliberate, and <clears throat> I just want everybody to know Forward that we thinking. appreciate everything and everyone. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, and you know, I, you know, you, you guys get to hear me, right? But there's a tremendous team back there looking at things, and you know, not to, if I, if I start pointing people out like Season sure. and and right. and John and and some of them, they, you know, they don't want to miss someone. But there's there's a lot of people that really take I'm this sure. seriously and are working every day really hard uh, to try and be forward looking, uh, try to try to put measures in place <clears throat> and look at alternatives and prepare the best way we can for something that we've never faced before. So yeah. a lot of people really making up that team. So a uh, good, co big kudos to them and our partner agencies, um, even our municipalities. Look at the, the effort that the sheriff talked about and enforcing, I mean, you know, you had over 300 beach closures, and there wasn't a municipality I went through that didn't have their crews out there working with us to make those things happen. So, um, true partnership and, and from everyone. Madam Chair, I sure will. I just want to thank you again, Madam Chair, but I just want to tell Barry I, I can see the, uh, the Army influence. He runs <laughs> a tight conference call. Yes. I like yes, he that. does. I like that. <laughs> Very well done, sir. Yeah. I think I need some tips on that. Um, Mr. Long. Yes, and um, not to repeat what everybody's already said, but I just cannot tell you how much I appreciate being able to participate in the morning briefings every day. It just gives us such a great platform from which to mm -hmm. respond to the citizens that are reaching out to each and every one of us on a daily basis. I mean, it's just incredible. That yep. said, um, mm -hmm. I also want to extend a personal <laughs> gratefulness and thank you to our staff on the fifth floor that mm -hmm. have been so good about calling in and being part of it as well because it helps them respond to our citizens, you know, j just as though we are as well. Mm -hmm. And so um, all in all, it's just an incredible team effort and really speaks to the public service heart mm -hmm. of everyone involved in county government. I just could not be more proud. Yes, Yeah, I again, I, not to repeat again what people have said. I just echo all those comments. And you're right; it is a huge team effort, and our and our assistants are just amazing. Um, they're so you know, excited about helping in any way that they can, and uh, I really appreciate them too. Um, and just the, the only other thing I was going to ask the county attorney is: Do you know when you'll give us that interpretation on that one item? When do, when we expect it? Because we're going to be getting calls. I, I, I'm pretty sure that it, it allows us to st keep them open, but I, I just I'm, want to make sure that... I'm looking at it now. We'll, we'll get something today. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. And to that point, if yeah. I may, Commissioner Eggers, um, one of our folks on our lobbying team for not county government, but a couple other agencies that I serve on, has already reached out to the governor's office personally and confirmed that, yeah exactly what the, everybody's the boat ramps say. are open the boat okay. ramps yeah. are open yeah. Yeah. Get that in writing. i'm sorry <laughs> get, that, get in that in writing well, it, i'm sure well, we i don't can. know if you uh got a report from uh, lordis about the regional phone call we had the other day yeah uh, with some <clears throat> other electeds how'd that go yeah oh. uh, <laughs> it made me really appreciate pinellas county and how much we have going on okay. <laughs> You'll have to ask her about I, it. I'm not going to comment <laughs> publicly on that. Well, it was the um, whole, everything we talk about on those, in those eight o'clock calls, were questions that they hadn't even start asking yet. Yeah. I mean, scary actually. I mean, well, <laughs> and, you know, we we do have a good team, and and I will tell you just to your comment, Commissioner Long, we're already you know thinking about the same way we do for a hurricane. We're thinking about um, you know after action and how do we improve. Well, we're used to something where we're watching a five-day window. Well, when it's, you know, with it's 45 days, communication's a whole lot different, you know, yeah. and stuff. So, like, the, the, the early morning calls, you know, that's, that's something they had to, you know, kind of institute on the fly. So we'll learn from it. We'll incorporate that, and, you know, and uh, it'll make us better in our emergency operations. But I do think uh, that was a good point. I thought that the, the, the idea of having 
regional conversation is a good one right. that it needs is. to happen at our staff level and, and bring it up. I, that meeting seemed to have like an agenda that was a like mile long. <laughs> no, I was listening yeah. to just part of it. First of all, it was like, where did this come from? And the agenda was huge. And oh, there's no way you could really a, attack anything. Having said that, I do think the idea behind that regional discussing. But it was of, really more of a staff to staff thing yeah, that should yeah, have been happening. Exactly. Because exactly. I kept yeah. asking Morgus to answer the questions. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't no. know, well, I don't know how many. And those are things that we've, you know, we've, we've tried to implement a um, little bit haphazardly um, as we went along here, trying to yeah. be consistent, recognizing yeah. Yeah. that different sets of commissioners feel differently about different things, yeah. you know, yeah. for their. For their particular county um, and that's right. okay but we right. we have tried to coordinate at a county we administrator should. level um, probably uh, we could do a lot more um, well, and but, I got the but, impression that maybe the electeds didn't even know that you were doing that yeah in and some cases well so. again we're, we're talking not necessarily coordinating and you know that's something we can probably improve on in the future but you know we, we are trying to do that I was uh, you know texting right. back and forth with Mike Merrill this morning so we had so much going on that others didn't yep <laughs> Anyway. Ask one other quick question. So, uh, several of us were on a conference call with uh, Congressman Chris, and I laid out the, the federal stimulus. And there was an article in the Times, I think, today or yesterday, I can't keep track, where c cities less than 500,000 can't access That's a piece correct. of that, but we can. I think That's only correct. Jacksonville qualifies. So have you talk, started talking with the cities about how that's going to work, or have we started looking at? We have started looking at it. No, I have not had direct conversations about that. But you we don't are need to sleep, Barry. We are I mean, breaking. Yeah, right. Well, right. we are breaking that down. I met with Bill Berger yesterday okay. regarding that. That is one of the options. But but remember, the dollars have to be used for things impacted by uh, the coronavirus. So I can't throw it into the uh, city's general fund. We can't divide it up the same right. way we do. Um, you know, the gas tax or something. Yeah. Right. I mean, we really need to think about how do we get assistance to people that are impacted by this. So, mm -hmm. you know, throwing everybody a thousand dollars is right. not the answer. We want to come up with programs that help people that, uh, that are impacted by this. And so how do we do that in working with partnerships of the cities? Well, we absolutely agree. Well, we need to figure out what that right answer is. And Doris is leading a team with okay. Bill Berger and them to, to bring people together to start talking about that. Okay. But we're, we are looking at that. Thanks, sir. Great. What time does the mock? Uh, half an hour from when we stop here. Oh. Right? Okay. Are we done? Okay. We are adjourned. Great. Thank you. Sure.